Excellent. And we're away. Okay. So welcome everybody to the first episode of Active Inference Insights, brought to you by the Active Inference Institute. I am your host, Darius Parvizi Wayne, and today I have the privilege of speaking to Professor Carl Friston, one of the most revolutionary thinkers in the fields of neuroscience, cognitive science, theoretical biology, and dare I say, physics and philosophy. A leading authority in neuroimaging, he is the inventor of statistical parametric modeling and voxel-based morphometry. I hope I pronounced that correctly. More recently, he has posited the free energy principle, which is technically a normative account of self-organization in terms of optimal Bayesian design, or in other words, a description of how things continue to be things. As such, his groundbreaking ideas hold profound implications, not only for biology and psychology, but also the very nature of reality itself. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Professor Carl Friston. Professor Friston, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. But what you can say is I, I just invented lots of three-letter acronyms. That's much simpler. <laughs> so so you have. And I sense a lot of three-letter acronyms have also spawned from, <laughs> from a lot of your work. Um, excellent. Well, this podcast, so this is the first episode, so as, as I was saying sort of off camera, this is very exciting for me, hopefully very exciting for everyone tuning in. The kind of, uh, the reason why it's come about is that we wanted, to, the Active Inference Institute wanted a way to introduce the ideas of active inference and the free energy principle, perhaps to an audience who were not PhD holders, scholars in the area, but had a kind of latent interest in psychology, neuroscience, maths, biology, whatever it is, and wanted to explore these ideas a little bit further. Uh, a little bit further. So it's a non-specialized introduction to the ideas of active inference and the free energy principle. And as the author, inventor, discoverer of the free energy principle, we can have an interesting philosophical conversation about what that is. Um, it's, it's an absolute delight to have you. So I guess my first question that I need to ask for everyone listening is, could you give us a very brief, or not very brief, but a very um, accessible definition of the free energy principle, um, what free energy is, and how you know what this what this principle says about reality and, and ourselves. Yes, I'm not very good at giving brief answers, but I'll <laughs> do my. We, we have we have a while, so so go ahead. Good. Um, so. Just to put things in context, um, the free energy principle is a principle um, as read by a physicist or engineer. That, that means it's a method, um, much like Hamilton's principle of least action that you can apply. Um, so one might ask what are the, the most important applications of the free energy principle? I, I guess that would be active inference. So I will answer your question. And I will say what the free energy principle is, but um, that may have to be qualified by looking specifically at the application, which is active inference, and what that means um, teleologically, heuristically, you know, what it brings to the table when you do apply the free energy principle. But the free energy principle itself um, is just a description of things that persist or exist, and it rests upon a careful specification of what you mean by a thing. Um, it starts with the exactly the same assumptions that all of physics starts with, basically a random dynamical system. Some people describe that in terms of um, stochastic differential equations. For, if you're not familiar with that kind of description, it's just saying that you can describe the universe in terms of the way that states change as a function of themselves. So it's a very generic um, description of any given universe that just commits to the notion that there is a state of the universe and it could be very high dimensional and that it has some dynamics. So that's where the free energy principle starts. But the special thing about the free energy principle um, that distinguishes it from other um, formulations in physics, for example, quantum, thermodynamics, um, statistical and classical mechanics, all of which can be, if you like, derived from this basic uh, description of the world as a random dynamical system. The, the thing that um, separates the free energy principle um, or gives it its particular flavor is a careful 
distinction between the states of something and everything else. Uh, and the way that we do that is by inducing a separation, you know, uh, technically a partition of all possible states into three kinds, the states of something that are internal to the thing, everything else external to the thing, and then crucially, a set of states that separate the uh, internal from the external states that allow and couple the inside to the outside, and that's referred to as uh, um, the blanket states or a Markov blanket or boundary. Um, so a lot of this rests upon this, this notion of a boundary that um, on the one hand separates the inside from the outside of something, and by a thing I mean anything from a small particle to a, to a priest or a person, uh, anything that can be individuated and uh, possesses characteristic states constitutes some thing. Um, and with tongue in cheek, you therefore have a theory of every space thing. Uh, not everything, yeah. but everything. Um, so this Markov boundary or Markov blanket um, um, is a sort of crucial device um, in the sense that it allows you to individuate something from everything else, but at the same time, it um, couples the internal to the external states. So we're now talking about a special kind of physics and probably a more ubiquitous kind of physics, which is the physics of open systems, um, because the inside is now vicariously open to in exchange with the outside across the Markov blanket. And just uh, for interest, because this will be relevant later on for active inference, we usually divide the uh, blanket states into active and sensory states that can be regarded very simply as on the inputs and the outputs. Um, uh, technically, the, um, the inputs of the sensory states are defined in, um, in the sense that the in internal states don't influence the sensory states. And conversely, the active states are defined such that the external states don't influence the, the active states. So, but more simply, what we're saying is that something can be defined in terms of the influences upon it and the influences that it exerts through the blanket states on the outside world. So just given that assumption um, that entails um, existence in the sense that to define this Markov blanket, you have to, um, you need for the system to have some characteristic states, technically an attracting set of states that you'd find the thing in. Just by assuming the existence of this attracting set of this random dynamical system that possesses this distinction between the inside and the outside, everything else follows. And everything else, simply put, is you can read the internal and active states, sometimes referred to as the autonomous states of a particle or a priest or a person, um, as um, either, if you're a physicist, conforming to a particular principle of least action, and that principle of least action is that um, it minimizes the path integral of the variation of free energy. Um, if you want to think of this more intuitively, because that uh, free energy also stands in for or is an approximation to a, a bound upon model evidence you can also say that it must be the case that the autonomous states of anything will look as if they are trying to maximize the evidence for what we would now um, consider the internal states to be um, uh, a model of what's going on on the outside. So um, some people refer to that as self-evidencing. Um, so if I just repeat that from the physicist's point of view, given the assumption that you've got this random dynamical system with an attracting set that can uh, has this partition that allows you to individuate something within this system, it has to be the case that the dynamics of the autonomous states of that system um, perform a gradient flow on a quantity called variation free energy. That's it. Is that interesting? Well, it becomes interesting if you realize that this variation free energy has a particular meaning and a, uh, you know, um, uh, a particular interpretation that gives you 
a teleology for this kind of dynamic. Uh, and that teleology is often referred to in terms of Bayesian mechanics. Why? Well, because the, um, the free energy, the variational free energy, is the same quantity that measures the evidence for a generative model of the causes of some data if you're a statistician. And in this instance, the data that we're talking about are the impressions of the outside state on the, on the Markov blanket. So um, what you're now in a position, or well, you're now in a position, you are now licensed to talk about anything that exists in some uh, simple or elemental sense, uh, performing inference and possessing this or evincing this kind of Bayesian mechanics. Um, and uh, in philosophy, um, people like Jakob Howey nicely summarize this as self-evidencing. So you can imagine that it looks as if anything that exists is basically moving in a way, uh, sensing and acting upon its world in a way that's garnering um, evidence for its own existence. So it's, it's, this is, uh, you know, if you like, a, a slight cheat in the sense of, you know, what we're doing is describing the dynamics of something that exists. And then we're saying, ah, but it now looks as if, it, in, in, in virtue of, of its existence, it is now, it can be described teleologically as acting to gather evidence for its own existence, its own, um, um, its own structure. And that structure entails a generative model of what's going on on the outside. So how does that help? Well, it doesn't really help in any fundamental way other than it's very pretty. And, it, and it's nice to talk about Bayesian mechanics as being a sort of complement uh, or another kind of physics and, that comes from the same stable as quantum uh, mechanics and system mechanics and, I repeat, uh, classical or uh, Lagrangian mechanics. Um, however, there is a nice um, application at hand once you realize that this, uh, once you interpret um, the variation of free energy in terms of a um, uh, technically a, 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 the logarithm of some model evidence. What that means is that you can now build things. You can build things and you can simulate those things. Why? Well, because you know that their dynamics must be um, conforming to this principle of least action. Um, uh, another way of thinking about this is that it um, does a gradient descent or a hill climbing on a particular um, functional, which is um, this um, variational free energy or the negative variation of free energy, which is the log evidence. So, and because this log evidence uh, is a function of a model that just is a description of the characteristic states things occupy or things are found in, um, you can now write down the generative model, which is just a probability distribution over the characteristic states or defining the characteristic states you want your thing to be attracted to. This is the attracting set. And once you've written down your generative model, you can then work out the gradients um, of the free energy functional of that generative model. And then you can simply um, integrate or mathematically solve for the dynamics, the flow, the motion, the movement of this thing. So I know this isn't terribly accessible, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it's the way I think of these things, that you are uh, now in a position, instead of just looking at something and, and saying, oh, well, I wonder what uh, generative model um, would be fit for purpose to describe this particular thing. You can now turn that on its head and say, OK, I want this kind of thing and I'm going to describe and define this kind of thing with a particular generative model. I just have to write down the probability distribution um, over the causes and consequences from the point of view of the thing in question, namely the external states and its impressions upon um, the Markov blanket. And once I've written that down, I can now simulate the autonomous states. I can now create a little autonomous artifact, a little autonomous particle that behaves in exactly the same way as something that existed that had that kind of generative model. So it's a very practical, if you like, um, uh, uh, it's a principle that can be applied in a very practical way to simulate things. And if you can then simulate things, you can start to build things, you can start to uh, 
um, um, do computational neuroscience. You can start to sort of naturalize cognitive um, neuroscience and possibly even sort of um, psychology in terms of the physics that is inherent in this Bayesian mechanics that comes from the free energy principle. Um, you can also start to ask questions about the beliefs of another person. Why? Well, part of this generative model or um, the generative model can always be sort of um, split into two things, sort of priors before you see some data and the likelihood, the likelihood of that data given um, the causes of that data. This would be the external state. So you have prior belief over the causes, the external states, and you have a likelihood that maps the causes to the consequences, which are your observations, so your, your sensations. Um, and therefore, you can now fiddle with, and say, um, a, a synthetic subject or person who is being simulated in the computer until their behavior, their actions, possibly their decisions matches that of any given um, cohort or any given um, um, subject or animal. Um, and then having adjusted the priors part of the generative model and possibly the likelihood, you've now basically created a digital twin that emulates the same kind of belief updating, the same kind of Bayesian mechanics um, that you can now infer is possessed by the thing in question. So this is a um, sort of quite a high-end application, which which is um, you know one of the the, um, the motivations for um, de for developing the free energy principle and and active inference as an application um, that it enables you to essentially phenotype another thing, another person, for example, in terms of this belief updating, in terms of this Bayesian mechanics. Um, and that can be quite useful in contexts when you want to understand how people work and particularly how their belief updating works. And this becomes particularly interesting in the context of computational psychiatry, where you want to be able to explain people's behavior in terms of what do they believe about the world out there? You know, how, how, do, um, how are they sense making? How are they assimilating evidence for their world model? which you can read as the generative model, uh, and under what priors are they doing, doing this sort of Bayesian um, assimilation or evidence accumulation um, that underwrites their decisions. So that's one, um, um, one particular application. There will be other applications, um, you know, if you want to make intelligent artifacts or you want to understand the mechanisms of belief updating at different temporal scales, um, belief sharing between two things that are in communication or transacting across their a shared Markov blanket or indeed uh, looking at a shared world um, and then one can start to get into the world of um, distributed cognition and federated inference. There are all sorts of things you can do once you start to apply active inference. Yeah, I, that was that was fantastic. I mean, we have a lot to get our get our teeth into, um, and and probably some concepts there that are new to a to a, to our audience. So it might be worth sort of backtracking certain things and and, and trying to um, find a, a kind of a, yeah, a, 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 let's sort of dissect some of these concepts together. Um, the first thing I want to speak about is this notion that the internal states in some sense embody um, the, the kind of desirable model given their attractor state, the desirable model of the world. I think um, one of these, one of the questions that one has when one enters into the world of active inference is whether an organism is a model or whether an organism has a model. And here we sort of have a, a backtrack to cybernetics and the good regulator theorem that all good um, regulatory systems have a model of their environment if we think about thermostats or um, anything alike. So maybe it's worth unpa unpacking that because I think a lot of people might have this intuitive sense that there's a homunculus in the brain which has a model of the world and it's very internalist. But maybe from a more physics perspective, we can adopt a more externalist position where there isn't this little thing which has a sort of representative 
picture of the world, but actually is just enacting um, some model of itself, which in many ways is just some it, some version of the of its external dynamics. Um, so let's start there because I think that will feed nicely into maybe a conversation about internal and external dynamics and exactly what that looks like in the free energy principle. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and uh, you know, some sort of deep issues unearthed by that. And it's nice you've introduced cybernetics, the notion of the good regulator theorem. Because, you know, in one on one view, I think you can look at um, the free energy principle as just a twenty first century version of that kind of cybernetic thinking. There are other there are other things that the free energy principle inherits uh, from. Um, you know, James's Max Mentor principle, lots of ideas in, in, in psychology, uh, perceptions, hypothesis testing. There are lots of different um, roads that converge upon this um, um, formulation um, that, that um, is on offer in terms of the free energy principle. Um, but that particular question is, is, is really interesting. Uh, I have to say that I usually um, try to elude that question by saying that the, 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 the internal states entail a generative model. Mm. So, uh, um, however, I, um, if, I ha if one was pressed upon it, um, then um, I would say very clearly uh, that the internal states, um, the thing is a generative model. It's not, if you like, um, a picture that you painted in terms of that homunculus looking at its sort of, you know, its virtual reality inside its head and trying to predict what's going on. It, it is instantiated, it is realized in its physics, in its existence, in its dynamics. Um, the reason I use the word entailed is that the generative model um, is um, technically uh, just a probability distribution. Um, so uh, you, you ask yourself, well, does a probability distribution exist um, in some physical sense? Um, and the answer is, well, no. Um, a probability distribution is what it is. It's a, a mm. mathematical description. Um, however, that um, probability distribution will have sufficient statistics that could exist. So what I'm saying is that, um, for example, let's take a Gaussian distribution. Um, you know, I can I can um, express mathematically. I can write down the notation for a, your know, Gaussian a bell-shaped distribution over some variable that goes from plus to minus infinity. Um, or I can say I can characterize or specify this Gaussian distribution in terms of its mean and its variance, and that, and those are two numbers that are not random variables, they are sufficient statistics. And it may be, and in fact, it is the case that the, 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 um, the free energy principle associates the, the physical internal states with the sufficient statistics of these Bayesian beliefs. And there's a lovely story uh, you know, in mathematics um, that would take you down the path of information geometries and statistical manifolds and um, belief updatings as movements in these geometries and, you know, uh, to try to understand the, the metrics in these spaces and how that relates to uncertainty and precision. All, all, that's a, you know, a, a lovely story. Um, we don't need to really pursue that at the moment. But the, the key th the point being made here, the, the generative model um, is not physically instantiated other than in terms of some uh, sufficient statistics in any setting. Um, however, in the in the free energy principle, the generative model is in of, of itself never actually instantiated in terms or realized in terms of um, its um, statistic, uh, sufficient statistics. And that's because of something that we were talking about before, which is the dynamics. So the dynamics is a gradient flow, um, which means that all we need are the gradients of the free energy. So we don't need the generative model. All we need is the gradients of this free energy function, or fu technically a function or a function of a function of the generative model. So if I was building an artifact, I could certainly prescribe the right dynamics by writing down a generative model, and then I could evaluate the gradients of that, um, of that um, free energy function of the generative model. And then those gradients would actually drive the dynamics. I could simulate self-organization. I could simulate active inference. I could simulate belief sharing, whatever I wanted to do. Um, but in that simulation, 
all I really needed were, were the gradients of the free energy. Uh, and we only need the generative model because the, um, the free energy is a function of the generative model. So in that sense, the generative model is really a teleological description that you would bring to the table to understand your sense making of another thing. Um, the thing in and of itself just needs the free energy gradients. It just needs to self-evidence by moving in the direction of maximizing the, on average, the log evidence for some abstraction, which is a generative model. Um, but it doesn't need to know that. Um, um, just to, you know, so we don't confuse people. So moving up those log evidence uh, gradients, very much like um, you know, the paradoxically moving up uh, concentration gradients to sort of clump together and to keep in this tra attracting set and to resist the dispersion of the random fluctuations inherent in these random dynamical systems is just the same as moving down the negative log evidence, which is the um, um, the uh, the free energy itself it's 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 the same thing so what does that mean well it um what it means is that the generative model is something that you bring to the table to um endow the behavior of this thing with an explainable teleology um of the kind it looks as if this thing is acting in a way to maximize the evidence or gather the evidence for its generative model. And this is what I think its generative model is. But notice the thing in and of itself doesn't <laughs> go through this process. Um, right. It could, of course. So if I now, people, things like you and me, we, we do have a model mm. of our model. We do have, um, and we communicate it and we talk about it. But most things, uh, you know, um, 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 uh, most things would not, would, would not possess that, um, that deep structure. So you can invoke homunculi, you can invoke self-modeling, you can invoke um, um, your uh, the kind of um, not homunculus in in the sense that you would normally um, um, end up with an um, you know with with an infinite regress, but you know the the kind of metacognitive aspect that comes from any deep or deeply structured hier uh, hierarchical generative model you you, know, you 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 can you can get that sort of homunculus like detachment and metacognitive uh, perspective on things but strictly speaking um you know the generative model is 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 only entailed by the dynamics and i should say that you know th this th th is probably best to think about um you know, applications of the free energy principle in, in you know in in um, as being limited to simulating and modeling and understanding other things uh, as opposed to oneself, unless one's doing a lot of self modeling. And um, yes. so, so in that sense, you are ascribing um, a teleology, a purpose um, um, that would explain the behavior of something that you're observing. But notice, because you are observing it from its point of view, you are an external state. And from your point of view, all you can see is the Markov blanket. You cannot see what's going on on the inside. So it is. Um, it will be mathematically impossible for you to ever know whether what's going on on the inside is indeed um, um, describable as even a gradient flow on a free energy functional um, let alone did it have its own internal model did it have, it have its own beliefs it just looks like that from your point of view because you'll never ever know by definition if you knew then you would um, by definition have breached the Markov blanket and that thing would cease to exist as the kind of thing that it was before um, mm. I mean, it may sound obvious or it may sound trivial, um, but I don't think it is. If you just look at uh, people like me who spend our entire lives trying to peer through the Markov blanket using brain imaging, for example, um, you know, or people doing um, um, comparative anatomy by dissecting dead things, um, um, 
or by inventing new techniques to try to, to try and get uh, you can never get beneath the Markov blanket, but you can certainly sort of um, have certain perspectives on the Markov blanket that are closer and closer to the internal states, but you can never actually get in there. I mean, you know, there's a I imagine a whole philosophy on this that so you 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 couldn't um, see your own um, uh, visual processing, you couldn't hear your own cochlear dynamics. Um, you, know, you, you, you you can't um, ever have access to the inside very much in the spirit that internalists would say you can never have direct access to the outside. Um, so I think that also applies to these stories about generative models and the Bayesian mechanic interpretation of uh, that comes along with the uh, with the free energy principle. Does that help in some way? It's a little bit subtle, and uh, I can just imagine a lot of my friends tearing their hair out because they have very particular views about this. You mm. know, some people think it's a, you know it's a model of a model. Some people think it's you know take a very internalist. Some people externalist. Yeah, uh, but mathematically, um, you know, it's it's not the model which drives drives us. It, you know, it, it is the it is the dynamics which drives us, and that dynamics can be interpreted in relation to a generative model. Should you want to? Excellent. Well, I'm going to follow that philosophical line of thinking, and what I want to ask is: this is an interesting point that the notion that we can get to a closer approximation of what the internal states of ourselves are, for example, but it's always going to be an approximation because piercing the Markov blanket would constitute self disintegration under the under the uh, rules of or the principle. The free energy principle per se. How, how, in a sense, therefore, do we know, or, or how, 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 uh, how much can we even make the claim, therefore, that there is such a thing as an external dynamic that goes beyond anything, goes beyond our sensory inputs? Um, it may seem like a deeply non-scientific question, but um, you, the way you were speaking, couldn't, I couldn't help but think of people like George Barclay and even Kant and this phenomenal noumenal distinction. If we don't ever have direct access to so-called external dynamics, because that is part and parcel of the, the, the physical game that we're in, why can't we just say that there are no hidden states and all we get are probability distributions over sensory appearances, but we don't need something like a likelihood mapping to something that's latent? Um, well, you, 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 you could say that, and, and a lot of my friends do say that. <laughs> um, and I think in the sense that um, the, the, the notion of direct access means that um, you will never know in some sort of heuristic sense um, what the external states are, if they exist at all. And, and um, um, on the other hand, you could also argue um, that um, there is profound access to the um, uh, and existentially meaningful access to the external states. It's just organized in such a way that it uh, it has to be transacted by the Markov blank blanket. Um, so you know, I haven't I haven't had this conversation for for for, for several years now. So yeah, I, I used to have lots of pat answers, which. Um, mm. Uh, depending on who, who I was talking to, but the, the, you know, when, the way that you phrase a question, which was very clever, um, just made me think. Well, you know, what is the internalist argument? Does it mean that because I don't have direct access, that the external states don't directly influence me? That means that they don't exist. Um, is, is you know, is that the the argument that an internalist would make? Well, may, might it be the case that all we have we we don't need to invoke a kind of further realm, a further causal realm, an underlying ontological realm. If all we have are just the streams of sensory input and seemingly some regularities, some patterned regularities in them, why, at least in terms of doing the Bayesian modelling, do we need to invoke a hidden state, a, an underlying cause? For example, like if we just take that, if we look at the low row tax of inference, we talk about how human, if we talk about how cognitive creatures like ourselves predict the world let's say at a very simple level i a question that i've always had is why do we why does the claim to predictive processing or predictive coding more generally why does it make claims about hidden states 
why doesn't it make claims just about regularities within streams of appearances? That's the way that I would pose that question. Right. Um, so, so I'm just mindful you've introduced uh, predictive coding and predictive yeah. processing. We have we have actually got yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> perhaps it would and just to, just to, uh, for those people um, who may not uh, know that the, you know, the intimate relationship between all these things. So, another way of looking at free energy is this: the uh, amount of prediction error, and more specifically, if you're talking to some people, it would be the uh, the total amount of precision weighted prediction error, um, which means that there's another reading of minimizing free energy, which is not the maximizing the model evidence, but um, minimizing surprise, where surprise is the implausibility of some sensory data um, given your model of that data. So in exactly the same way that if I go around gathering data that I find uh, continuously surprising, um, then that's basically evidence I haven't got the right kind of model to be um, to be able to explain, i.e., predict those th uh, those data. Um, so again, we have one of these um, um, sort of completely equivalent descriptions, but you know they have very different uh, flavors. That to maximize model evidence is to minimize surprise, which is to minimize a prediction error, which is to maximize predictability, which is to minimize variational free energy, and so on and so forth. They're all the same. They're all the same thing. So when you're talking about predictive coding as a particular um, algorithm for minimizing free energy, uh, technically um, you know, a variational scheme, which is known in engineering as a Kalman filter, um, what you're saying is you know, I'm making certain assumptions um, about my generative model um, that means I can write down these free energy gradients as prediction errors. So literally the, the prediction error, my, uh, my apologies, the precision weighted prediction error literally is mathematically exactly the gradient that we were talking about before. Um, so just to this is, you know, join the dots. Um, so anyway, Thank to come back to your question, um, uh, why is it that um, I need to invoke latent states in order to make sense of data. Um, I would argue um, that the sense making is just explaining data in terms of latent states. Um, and um, those latent states are often referred to in, um, you know, in the technical literature as, as hidden states. And what do you mean by that? Well, it just means they're unobservable they're, from the point of view of the free energy principle, they are hidden behind the Markov blanket. So I would say that detecting patterns simply is invoking latent states that organize the structure of those patterns. Um, so um, I don't think there's anything magical about, about latent states. So the latent states that are, if you like, entertained by your internal dynamics and your sense making um, uh, are not the external states, you know, the, the, they are descriptions that are only relevant to the generative model that um, you need in order to define the prediction errors or the free energy gradients in order to um, dis, you know, simulate or describe um, your sense making in terms of your neuronal dynamics or your internal dynamics or the operations of say a thermostat. But there's a twist here. Um, um, there's a reason it's called active inference because it's got a big active at the front. Um, so it's not good enough just to say, oh, I can understand psychology just as making lots of sense of my sensory impressions. That's that's not good enough um, because, you know, you are um, in, coupled to the world um, in, 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 in reciprocally, which means that you actually um, are not only are you exposed to the world, but the world is exposed to you in an exactly symmetrical way. And what would that, um, you know, how could one describe that? And then we come back to uh, where, we, where we started with this partition of blanket states into sensory and active states, in, into the inputs and the outputs, um, which means that sense making is quintessentially active. So one way of phrasing that is that, yes, I'm making sense of all this sensory data and all the patterns. Um, but at the same time, I'm actually in charge of and actively soliciting those data, causing those patterns. Um, so I think once you um, once you bring that sort of inactive 
um, aspect to the table. So notice, um, I noticed that you you you, you uh, treated predictive coding as a, as a sort of um, generalization of predictive processing. It might be easier if you did it the other way around because then you have the grace to um, accommodate action in predictive processing in its most general sense. And if you don't, then predictive processing, it, you know, I think is an incomplete story. And you have to have um, as part of the processing the active solicitation, the um, the, the garnering and the structuring and querying the world in a way that reciprocates with the right kind of information that allows you um, to do the good sense making in terms of um, you know, the latent states that we're, that we're talking about. Um, I mean, formally, I mean, this takes us um, into another part of the story which we, 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 we didn't previously unpack about active inference. So somebody might ask, well, okay, so we've got this um, um, application of a, um, a free energy principle that a physicist might be quite comfortable with um, to um, behavior that entails some kind of sense making. Um, cheekily, we, you know, I, I like to call this sentient behavior, and then I get told off for that. Um, but um, so, we, uh, so how does this differ from um, reinforcement learning? You know, how how, how your know, behavioral psychology? Um, it differs in a quite fundamental way, uh, because the the big thing that active inference brings to the table is that um, first of all, it says you are in charge, you are actively. Uh, sensing, you know, it says this is active vision, active perception, active inference in, in its most general sense, um, which means now what are the imperatives for generating your own data? Now you could, if you were doing behavioral psychology uh, you know, um, of, of a behaviorist sort in the 20th century, you could say, well, I just want to generate those sensations that I find rewarding. Um, and so I've got some um, privileged sensory um, channels that um, I'm going to label as, as reward and I'm just going to act in a way that maximizes the reward that comes in. From the point of view of the free energy principle that's not what that's not what happens. What happens is I want to find those data that resolve the expected surprise or the expected free energy consequent on acting, soliciting those data. So what's expected surprise? Well, technically, it's an entropy. It's just a measure, a mathematical measure of uncertainty. So what that means is that the um, the the description of things that persist or exist over some particular period of time um, reduces now to a kind of Bayesian mechanics in which the behaviour will look as if it is information seeking and uncertainty resolving. Um, it will look as if it is responding to these epistemic affordances under constraints, and it is those constraints that, um, um, if you like, would be the homologue of the reward. Um, they are literally the constraints endowed by the prize on the generative model, the kind of um, sensory states that, that, that constitute this attracting set you know, to which I am attracted. But the, the vast majority um, of the drives for, for good um, good behavior or sort of behavior that things that exist would evince um, is this resolution of uncertainty this information seeking and indeed you know um, that leads you into considerations well what what is the how would you describe that kind of information that optimal uh, information seeking behavior um, if you were a, a scientist or um, if you were an engineer and if you were a scientist you'd be looking at the principle of optimal Bayesian design um, articulated by people like uh, Dennis Lindley uh, in the middle of the last century um, where you measure the quality of an action in terms of the information gain afforded by the data that uh, you secure by acting in this way exactly the same idea um, um, emerged in the context of active learning in machine learning. Uh, <clears throat> you know, this is the problem. of If getting data is costly, what data point would I need to resolve the greatest uncertainty about my um, beliefs about the latent causes of those data? Um, so active learning, again, notice actives, uh, you know, actives um, 
you know, um, an explicit part of this process. So in answer to your question about, you know, would it be sufficient just to understand sentience in its most basic or elemental um, form as discovering patterns in data, I would say no, um, because that denies the openness of any given system immersed in her world um, in two directions, you know, the world influencing you and you influencing the world. And as soon as you put that into the mix, I think it's very difficult co to conceive of any construct, um, possibly not in, in philosophy, um, but certainly any construct in computer science or, um, um, uh, or physics that would um, um, that, that would permit a complete description of sentient behavior just in terms of sensing patterns. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, makes sense to me. Um, yes, I want to stay on action for a second because I think the the notion of uh, the minimization of free energy or the maximization of model evidence makes some uh, could make some intuitive sense for an agent like ourselves, in the sense that we we have our sensory inputs which are divergent from our priors, and we act to change the world to make that those those sensory outcomes more in line with our expectations, our preferences. However, at a more fundamental level. Uh, one one definition that we spoke about with the free energy principle is that the internal and external states look like they're tracking one another across a Markov blanket. Now, a question that comes to my mind when there's, when I see a definition like that, which is, I un that makes sense for me uh, for a sentient, conscious human, but what would a stone be tracking, or what would a drop of oil be tracking? To use an example that you've um, used before, I think so using going to something a bit more less animate and i presume the answer lies in animacy um i think would be a really interesting avenue to go down because it gets to these fundamental questions of how does something as minimal as a particle retain its particleness and and what and what does that really look like when when we don't when we presume that they're not conscious unless we're panpsychists but we won't go just down that route just yet <laughs> Well, that, that's where you were taking us, which, which is a, a fun place to be. Um, yes. right, so how, how, does, how does one um, elude panpsychism in the free energy principle? I think, well, I think you've, you've just, you've just uh, uh, ans answered your own question there. But so perhaps we would just unpack that a little bit. Um, yeah. So what's the difference between a stone um, and a thermostat? and 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 me um and i think what you're what you're now asking is um are there um what i will call natural kinds but i wasn't allowed to because that has a lot of philosophical baggage but for the purpose of this conversation i'll just say are there natural kinds of things um that display different kinds of behavior that uh, can we, that can be equipped with different kinds of teleology, and I would say absolutely. Uh, and you've just rehearsed, you know, the, the, you know, the, some, the, some of the key ones. So, yeah, yeah, as you noted, um, to be animate um, is a big thing, um, in the sense that the stone is not animate, um, uh, in the sense that it moves itself. You know, if stones started you know wandering uphill or flying around, that would be much more interesting. Um, but they don't have that animacy that is characteristic of biotic self-organization. So what does that mean in a sort of um, uh, deflationary sense of the free energy principle? It just means that the active states are an empty set. Um, and usually um, for stones, you might also argue the internal states are, are empty. We don't have to. Yeah, the stone can be um, you know, making sense of its world in terms of its latent states or can acquire that inter interpretation. Perhaps that's a nice example of what we were trying to um, get, um, drill down on earlier on in terms of um, is there a generative model. I mean, I, one could argue that a stone has a generative model of external milieu in terms of the temperature and that the latent variable 
which is a hidden state, it's a latent state, you know, as well known in statistical thermodynamics, which is a, a sufficient statistic of the distribution of things. And the temperature um, could well be uh, inferred by the internal, the interior of a stone. And therefore, it is making sense of the pattern of its sensory exchanges with the world on, on the surface of the stone, simply because it's warming and cooling and therefore tracking the ambient environmental temperature. So that's perfectly free energy principle consistent. Um, it's a very boring kind of uh, of sense making, but you know, and it is that boring kind of sense making that I had in mind when talking about um, if you preclude the active part of active inference and just think about sort of perceptual inference, um, then then you're sort of missing the point really. Um, but I think a stone is a good example of that. Now, would you say the stone has a generative model? Well, you could you could argue that, it, but. Uh, you know, it's you trying to trying to um, if you like explain the behavior of a stone, but the stone doesn't have very much behavior. Um, but you could you could start to think, well, now I can test a hypothesis. It is actually registering um, uh, the uh, the temperature on the inside. And again, just to rehearse the argument, the fundamental argument we were talking about before, you will never know though until you break the stone, because once you break the stone, it's no longer a stone. It's just a broken stone. Uh, so you know, exactly the same problems or issues confront you even with the stone. But you know, focusing on on that sort of big move from things with and without active states, I think then you're talking about things that are animate, things that have um, animacy and act upon the world. Um, is that sufficient to get the kind of behaviour that we've been talking about, which is um, you know the kernel of active inference in terms of um, what active inference brings to the table in, term, in terms of uh, information seeking and having a variety of different affordances, particularly epistemic affordances, um, as an explanation for, 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 um, for behaviour. Um, uh, you could argue no. You know, a thermostat can act upon the world. It can switch heating elements on or off, and it senses things by its, by its thermoreceptors. Uh, you could say, like very much like a Watts governor, um, it you know it now has active states. It has inputs and outputs, and it has internal dynamics. And um, um, and in one sense, the Watts governor is a good regulator, and therefore conforms to um, the cybernetic view of of of, of a generative model. And it's acting in the right kind of way. So, does this kind of system um, have that the curiosity that would be associated with information seeking and resolving uncertainty? And you would argue, well, no, it doesn't. So now you've got another kind of natural kind um, which does. So, what's the difference between a, you know, a, a what's governor or a thermostat or possibly a virus um, and me? Well, the, I think the key difference is a, a, a particular kind of um, self-modeling that just comes from being very big and a bit structurally complicated in the sense that there are certain parts inside my body and inside my brain that are so distant from the active states that are actually moving um, my arms, my actuators, or um, are engaging my autonomic reflexes, that I cannot see them directly. Um, and if that is the case, the only way that I now can sense my, the consequences of my action is vicariously through the sensory states. Now, this introduces a really interesting distinction between me and a virus. It means that I now will start to treat my own action as a hidden or latent cause of my sensations. And that brings to the table, okay, well, if now my own action is being inferred as a random variable, then now is a separation between what I think I'm doing or what my uh, active inference um, um, would um, allow me to talk about in terms of what, I, what I'm planning to do or what I'm inferring to do in, in the spirit of planning as inference and what I'm actually doing. So this um, brings you to a, you know, an even more, uh, a, a different kind of thing, which would be something like me, um, that now has beliefs about um, its own action. Um, 
which is distinct from the actual real variables you know um, that constitute the active states of the Markov blanket um, and as soon as I have beliefs about my own action I have to ask myself well as a physicist I would ask well what how uh, what what are the probability distributions over my um, my active states my um, those states that um, actually change the causes or, or the, um, the the external states generating my sensations and when you write that down um, what you get is exactly what we were talking about before which is this mixture of expected information gain you know, basically expected free energy that has can be decomposed into this information seeking part and the constraints afforded by your prior uh, the prior part of your generative model the things that you find very surprising perhaps just to unpack that um, um, intuitively you know Let's take the predictive processing surprise minimization view of um, self-organization and um, an active inference. And that means that I now have the pro I am the kind of creature that exists. Therefore, I must be minimizing my surprise. Furthermore, I now have beliefs about my actions. I have prior beliefs. I must have prior beliefs about my actions. Of course, this is all subpersonal. So what kind of priors would I have about my, my, my own actions? Well, I'm going to, um, because I exist and I'm a, um, a free energy surprise minimizing kind of thing because I exist, then I must choose those actions that minimize the surprise I expect following that action. So that means I'm going to minimize my expected surprise. Now, there are two ways in which I can do that. And we've already uh, spoken explicitly about the two ways. One way is just to notice that the average surprise, the expected surprise, um, is just uncertainty. So I can reduce my expected surprise or my anticipated or my um, average um, surprise um, by um, getting to grips and knowing you know, what would happen if I did that. Uh, with greater precision. So this is information seeking. This is the sort of the curiosity. Um, it's the novelty seeking part. It is the exactly the part that underwrites the um, the uh, base, the principles of optimum Bayesian design. Getting the data that minimise my uncertainty because uncertainty just is expected surprise. But there's another way of doing minimising expected surprise. If I know what is very surprising. If you know by being um, um, at very very low temperatures or being very poor or being snubbed socially, um, everything that is, if you like, not characteristic of me, given that I am you know that I exist in a, you know in a particular way, um, then any deviations of that basically uh, can be thought of as surprising. So if I stray beyond, very much in the spirit of. Um, homeostasis, although now we're talking about allostasis because uh, we're talking about the future, um, then I'm going to choose those actions that don't just uh, do the information seeking, responding to the epistemic affordances, but also will elude those kinds of surprising states that are very uncharacteristic of me, being very poor, missing out on that opportunity, uh, being embarrassed, uh, being in pain. Um, although pain is a, uh, probably a bad example. Uh, we're talking about the sensations that, that, that we want to uh, want to avoid. So um, that would speak to this, um, um, the, prior, um, the prior cost or the prior surprise, the negative which was, was the preferences you, me you mentioned before. So um, you can look at these constraints afforded by the priors, the pragmatic part, if you like, of, um, of these affordances. Some people call them instrumental, so you've got epistemic and instrumental um, affordances that just are the expected information gain and the negative expected cost which would be the um, you know uh, manifestation of the constraints you could look at the the complement of constraints in terms of where I don't go in my sensory state space um, as um, where I do go which are my preferences my preferred characteristic attract attracting sets so uh, just to remind myself and, not, and, and you and people who are listening still at this stage, um, why are we going through all this? Well, because this is what comes out of a, a consideration of 
beliefs, prior beliefs about the way active states should unfold. Uh, how, uh, and that becomes very pertinent when now I have to actually in, um, in, uh, embody those beliefs in my generative model. So suddenly now I become something that is very distinct from a thermostat or, or a virus, because now I have a generative model of the consequences of my action. And that generative model is very simple. It just says a priori, I will um, a priori think that the action that maximizes information gain and maximizes this instrumental value uh, are going to be the most likely policies. That, and this you, you know, could, uh, could be construed as a, um, a high end kind of planning as inference. It's not as trivial or simple as a, a sort of uh, KL control because we've got this epistemic uh, part, part, part of it, but it still has a spirit of planning as, of inference. So what I'm saying quite simply is there are certain things that plan and there are certain kinds of things that don't plan. A virus doesn't plan, the weather doesn't plan, evolution doesn't plan, the stone doesn't plan, and you could argue that many um, um, smaller insects don't plan. But as you get bigger things, then they start to plan. And I think you move from non-planning to planning, at which point, by definition, you are ascribing to these bigger things, like you and me, um, a be, um, ascribing um, a teleology to our behavior that rests upon a generative model that includes the consequences of its own action, which crucially equips it with the temporal depth because the consequences are in the future. So unlike the thermostat that doesn't need to look very far into the future, things that plan that are so big that they uh, lose contact with their actual actuators. Um, now look as if they have this sort of temporal depth, um, this, this temporal thickness to their generative models, specifically enabling them to, pl to uh, plan, in, plan their actions in, into the future. So that's how I would get out of the panpsychism argument. Okay, I've never, I've never heard that argument before um, about the distance from the actuators. That's very interesting. Um, because it seems in that sense that the temporal depth is downstream on size, in a sense. Um, is that is that a correct reading? And and is there a reading of your argument that you've just laid out there in which you can have deep temporal mod uh, modeling, planning as inference, and um, allostasis as well as a sense of um, retrospective inference? without being a large thing is that it, it, or is this notion of being uh far from your actuators so that you have to start disambiguating what is your action and what is the action of the world or other people is that fundamental um yeah i mean this this is a really interesting notion because I've, I've actually never heard it really be uh elucidated like that so i'd love to know whether there is a way that a virus could be doing deep temporal modeling despite its minimal size right yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I don't know. Um, but a, a, a sort of um, an intuitive answer uh, would be uh, no size really does matter. It really does matter. So by size, I, I, you know, I'm implicitly talking about the, um, the, the, the sparse coupling that underwrites the conditional dependencies in random numerical systems that give rise to Markov blankets and blankets and blankets. So um, I'm not literally talking about, you know, how 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 wide something is in terms of millimeters i'm talking about the sort of um the hierarchical depth of um condition and dependencies and being secluded behind markov blanket after markov blanket after markov blanket so um if you if you're comfortable associating um physical size with that um hierarchical depth in terms of um what a thing is in you know in terms of having this internal hierarchical structure internal markov blankets then i think the answer is very clear no you have to have you have to be sufficiently big so i'd be extremely surprised um so for example i, I haven't said this before but you know i would imagine very very small insects can't plan whereas you, um, something the size of a bee might be able to plan 
So I'd imagine that a Drosophila couldn't plan, but I, I would imagine a, a bee might just be able to get there. And it and it it starts. Um, you know, first of all, that 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 immediately speaks to, to a philosophical vagueness in terms of that temporal thickness, which which is interesting. I mean, is it is it categorical? You know, can I say this kind of artifact um, can be explained? in terms of a generative model that does not cover its own action because it has direct access to its actuators because it's sufficiently simple and small. There are no Markov blankets that intervene between the, um, the you know, the, um, the, the, effectively the, the, the sense making part and the, um, uh, and for example, sending predictions and the predictive processing spirit down to the, um, the actuators. Um, whereas this thing is so big that there are inevitably, with probability one, so many uh, Markov blankets that intervene, there is no now direct access to action upon the world. Um, and um, so that might be a, uh, a bright line. It might be a, um, a qualitative distinction between things that do and do not have um, uh, a representation of their own actions. Um, on the other hand, the counter argument I think would be this more vague notion that, that, that you know, even even a thermostat could be construed as having a little glimpse of the future simply because it could be um, uh, cast as say a PID controller, which basically um, um, invokes now rates of change. And as soon as you invoke rates of change, you've got sort of you know, a mathematical image of a little trajectory in, into the future. So it, it could be a great, it could be a graded thing. I've lost the, I've lost what your, the importance of your question. What well, we'll ask your question it, again? It was probably, it was probably unimportant. Um, but this no, is a really, important. sorry, it it, felt it, important. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go again. This is a very interesting line. I'd love to I'd I'd love to dive down into. So what so my interpretation of this, my my reading of this, is that in a sense, having bundles of Markov blankets embedded in Markov blankets leads to the inevitable inference that there is something like me which is doing something, and there is something that's not like me, which is also causing sensory um data that I'm receiving. That makes sense. Now let's let's tie in temporality to this does it does this does this mean that in a sense temporality is a corollary of selfhood in the sense that the selfhood is almost more fundamental than the the temporality because it comes from the dimensionality of the things that are mark of blankets upon mark of blankets and how can we integrate temporality and temporal thickness or depth um, into this picture, right? No, no, yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, you could tell the story in a number of different ways. You know, if you're talking to, um, for example, Chris Fields or Maxwell Ramstead, um, they might start talking about um, irreducible Markov blankets um, that necessarily uh, require the notion of nested Markov blankets, and that there is some one or more core irreducible Markov blankets that would have um, this aspect of looking at one's, one's own inference processes and acting internally. And they get the notion of mental action. And you can then start to work towards um, sort of qualitative experiences in terms of self-modeling and what that might look like. Um, the, other, the other way that you could tell this story is to know that um, to invoke um, the renormalization group if you were a, were, were a physicist and just know that when you're talking about any hierarchical generative model there is um, inevitably a, co a coarse graining that includes time in that in that depth um, which means very simply that the deeper parts of my generative model and indeed of viruses are on a free energy principle view um, um, encoding beliefs about things that change more and more slowly as you go deeper and deeper. So there's a separation of temporal scales 
Um, so, you know, a, a, a commonsensical view of this is that um, the, the neuronal representations uh, down near my primary auditory cortex, or indeed in, 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 in the brainstem, um, are representing very, very fast fluctuations in um, pressure and then frequencies and, turn, uh, and, and sort of scenographic like um, um, representations that are changing. Um, you know, possibly even in fractions of, of a millisecond if you're an owl, um, uh, but certainly over, over 100 milliseconds. Then I move up to sort of, you know, uh, primary auditory cortex, and I may be in the realm of sort of um, the, um, hundreds of milliseconds and sort of frequency glides that define phonemes, and I move up to secondary auditory cortices, and then through the auditory hierarchy, getting to the level of um, um, words right up to... Um, say, so, you know, some parts of the prefrontal cortex where we've got entire semantics and syntax and narratives and stories start to emerge. And as every time we go deeper into the hierarchy, we slow down or we extend the temporal compass, thereby providing a context for the faster influences and fluctuations at the level below. So again, we come to this, um, you know, notion of... Um, size entailing um, a, um, a, a certain kind of depth, in this instance, a hierarchical depth in the generative model, that, as you say, necessarily goes in hand in hand with a temporal depth and a separation of temporal scales. So I think you're absolutely right. There has to be a temporal aspect to deep generative models. And by deep, I just mean that there are nested Markov blankets. So you know, to, to define a hierarchy is only defined in terms of the conditional independences um, and implicitly the Markov blankets of one level in the hierarchy um, um, that defines it as a level in the hierarchy. Without the Markov blanket, uh, the hierarchy would not be there. So that's another example of this sort of um, um, being open but being closed um, um, but, and being able to individuate something from something else and, it, and this is as if the thing is just to the level of a hierarchical a hierarchical generative model that we're ascribing to um, the dynamics of, of some internal uh, of some internal states I think there's a third story you could tell which is possibly where you're going which is um, um, how it relates to, to consciousness um, um, in the sense, and, and this is a very simple story, that that, that, that um, if I am um, forming beliefs and doing um, belief Bayesian belief updating as prescribed by active inference about the consequences of my actions, then that has to be in the future, as we've just said, and perhaps certain things think deeper into the future than, than, than other things. Um, but notice what we've done here. It's about my actions. So not only have you committed to temporality um, and temporal depth and temporal thickness as an attribute of things that plan um, and are more like you and me, but you've also committed to agency. So now you've created from something that was previously not an agent into an agent, where I'm using agency in the sense that I, one would not say that a thermostat had agency, but you would say that I have agency um, in the sense that I have beliefs about the consequences of my action and I um, will or can be described as um, using those beliefs to select a particular action. And uh, you know, coming back to predictive coding formulations, that, that selection would basically, I'm going to predict the state of my um, motor plant or my autonomic um, nervous system and provide it with the right set points. And, and then the, the active states will actually reflexively fulfill those prophecies, those predictions. Um, and everything is working properly, I'll, I'll be a good allostat, or in Rochby's terms, a, a good homeost, a, a homeostat. Um, so what what you've done there is is bring agency into the game um, and I think that again this, this speaks to the inactive part that you know you now because you've got beliefs about the future and specifically the future that you have caused that you have authored you have now become an agent 
So we haven't, I think, got this at this stage to consciousness and self-awareness, but I think we've got the necessary foundation that there are only certain things. They'd have to be agents, I think, to be conscious of themselves as agents, as doing things, um, as things that exist in, um, um, in a world uh, in the sense that their existence is manifest in terms of the consequences of the way that they act upon that world if it wasn't you wouldn't need any of this you wouldn't need this temporal thickness you just be, you you know, you just need the apparatus of a stone or a thermostat to make to do to do your sense making but as soon as you've got agency in the game i think then you've got the, you've got something which takes a step closer to um having a very deep and possibly it's this irreducible Markov blanket um, 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 layer of the generative model or level of a, of a deep generative model, which actually now starts to entertain the hypothesis, I am an agent, um, which you don't need, but you could, and you have to ask yourself, well, why would you ever want to entertain that hypothesis, I am an agent? Um, so this would be minimal selfhood, just a representation um that i can be in different states of mind when it uh, that that, that uh, and those states of mind are something that underwrite or i can condition on in terms of what i am going to do and that doing could be internal it could be how i deploy attention in terms of precision weighting in predictive occurring occurring um, so it could be covert action or it could be overt action i could now um select um you know um certain plans that are at a lower level that would be then um, enacted by my motor system or my autonomic system if i was that that kind of creature does that make sense it makes sense and it's opened up a can of worms in my head um well inevitably because we brought in lots of concepts here and i want to try and unpick them um for people at home and for myself but it's fascinating so i'm loving it so, so let's keep going along this along this road We've got agency, consciousness, and temporality as, as these three things that I want to have a little look at. Starting with the first thing we talk, uh, you, you mentioned as a response to my question about temporality, that we have a deep hierarchy in which um, more deeper levels of the hierarchy are tracking um, slower fluctuations in the external dynamics and therefore contextualize and constrain the higher order faster dynamics. Is it, are we in this model, are we invoking time as a fundamental aspect of those external dynamics or is it an inference that the, that the, um, that the organism is making about the nature of reality that it's experiencing? Um, well, that's, that's a, a, again an excellent question. It certainly um, does not um, um, it does not address time perception, uh, you know, in, in terms of the psychophysics of time perception. Um, does it address um, time in, in a more fundamental sense? I, I don't think it does um, it, uh, in a sort of um, sort of folk psychological sense. Um, it's really um, so the, the 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 answer to that question normally um, is framed in terms of relative movements in a belief space, um, and um, so if you think of time as um, part of some metric space time, then what you're talking about is time as something that can be measured time that has a, a distance say milliseconds or seconds or, and the like um, could me um could, could uh, me as a generative model um um ever have access to or build um hypotheses uh, of time as a metric yes it's, we certainly could um however um, it would be very difficult, um, to, you know, ignoring sort of internal clocks and the like. Well, and actually, no, you don't have to ignore internal clocks. You then ask, how do you do it? And normally, what what the story uh, the story is, um, it's the the number of moves you make at one level relative to another level of a deep generative model, and the number of moves is quite crucial here in terms of time that down mathematically. Um, 
And my favorite way of thinking about the number of moves is basically something called the information length. And the information length um, um, refers back to something we've mentioned before, which is information geometry. So as if you think of our, um, so one picture of the free energy principle, uh, it's a, quite a technical picture, but I think it's quite useful, is that um, our internal, say, brain states, or the internal states of a thermostat, um, encode a probability distribution, a Bayesian belief, a conditional belief about some latent states, um, which means that for every state of the brain, there is, if you like, a point in the state space of all the physical states of the brain. But each point in that space now stands in for a probability distribution. And that means that um, this is a special kind of space because it is equipped with a metric. What is that metric? Well, it's the KL divergence. Well, the path integral of uh, infinitesimally small KL divergences as I move through this space. So this is what dis this is what defines information geometry. The, the information geometry is a very particular um, bit of mathematics um, or theorizing that applies to very very special state spaces or manifolds where every point in that on that manifold corresponds to a belief or a, a probability distribution so now what if the metric is the um the kl divergence or uh, you know the information length which is uh, uh, related to the um the accumulated kl divergences as i move from one point to another um, what we are saying is that the um, the number of moves I make, the number of units as measured with the uh, the um, this kind of metric, this information geometric uh, measure, um, which actually technically is this Fisher information, um, is is um, basically um, a description of um, the precision by which I measure whether I've changed my mind. So if we say that I've made n moves, that means I've changed my mind n times. And I know that because I can measure the information length and I've actually moved a, a significant, uh, by a significant, um, or by a measure that is large simply because it is large in relation to the precision that, uh, um, the, 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 that provides the distance between t any two points on this. So what that means, to put it very simply, is that time can be measured by the number of times I change my mind at level n in my hierarchy, divide, uh, divided by the number of times I change my mind at the lower level. So now you've got a relational, uh, you can gauge time by the relative degrees of belief updating, uh, you know, um, the information rate, which is the you know, um, 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 confusingly the, the the rate of change of the of the length with with time, but where time is now uh, contextualized by the level above or or by the level below. So you have this very relativistic view of time, um, and you could have different levels. Of, you know, I would imagine um, if you uh, you know, attend to different levels of your hierarchy, you could get a very different kind of uh, time perception. Indeed, we know that attentional set and um, um, in conditions where, um, say, taking psychedelics or uh, in things like Parkinson's disease, where, where you get um, changes in the neurobiological encoding of uncertainty and therefore this Fisher information metric, you can get distortions and different senses of time. Um, um, so what I'm saying is there are probably as many different senses of time as there are levels in a hierarchical model, and they can only really be measured in a, in, a, in a relative sense in terms of how many moves do I make at one level in, for any given move at another level. So um, that, that what, what we've done now is, if you like, um, take temporality off the table to the extent now that we're down just talking about uh, movements in an information space or a belief space that has this kind of information geometry. These are really fascinating issues. Uh, I think yet to be fully explored. Um, my, my friend Zaf um, um, has done probably some of the best work in, in, um, in this area. Um, 
but you know, it, it, it is it is to my mind um, a really interesting issue because it, you know it really forces you to think about the um, what you mean by separation of temporal scales and what we are what what kind of coarse graining over time is implicit in this kind of move from one level to uh, to the next level does that address your uh, what you were what you were yeah i mean as i was saying this is all really interesting um and again something i hadn't thought of um before in terms of in terms of this in, in terms of this contextualization process being about moves which implies to me that but there has to be it, it's like this sense of time is contingent on these moves that are being done at the different levels of the hierarchy does that process itself not imply some dynam some temporal dynamics how can one distinguish a move of 10 relative to a move of five without having segmented moves in some kind of space-time geometry. Yes, it is exactly that um, segmentation that appeals to the information geometry. Okay. Um, so you, you know, how would you actually do that segmentation? How, how would you measure um, the amount of belief updating um, in universal or clock time um, at one level of a hierarchy. And um, this is where the information geometry comes in. It's basically the number of different brain states that you have entertained during your movement on this statistical manifold, or, which is also, uh, you know, I think very nicely articulated in terms of belief updating. So you can literally think of this sort of, um, the space that would be traced out if I were to plot um, the activity of all my neurons, um, on every axis of some very high dimensional state space. That would be a statistical manifold. My belief updating, which is a continuous process, my gradient flow um, is literally moving on this manifold. The distance I move is the information length that literally scores the degree to which I change my mind. It's also mathematically the information gain um, as measured, well, closely related to the information gain as measured by um, the KL divergence between my prior and my posterior after I do my belief updating and I'm moving on this manifold. And the question is, you know, how far have I moved? Uh, and can I segment, segment that into units? And that's basically what the information length um, uh, you know, allows you to do. So I, I, I love this picture because um, if you just think about what kind of flows on this manifold would um, be prescribed by the free energy principle, because the free energy is a functional of the uh, beliefs um, encoded at each point, then the free energy is a landscape on the statistical manifold. So we are perpetually falling downhill on this manifold. The, the free energy gradients are themselves and the free energy is itself changing because my beliefs are changing. So I've got this lovely itinerant you know, model or picture in mind where I've got a statistical manifold. It is now um, my, where I have gradient flows, where I'm flowing on this manifold um, using a gradient flow on free energy, where the free energy now provides a Waddington-like landscape chasing minima all the time. And of course, that chasing reflects the fact that the free energy itself changes as you move around the manifold because your beliefs are changing and the free energy is uh, a function of belief. Um, and then you introduce this, uh, this notion, which I think is really important, um, the notion that the higher level of a, a deep model um, provides the context. And what would the context look like in terms of this free energy landscape? Well, it means that the landscape would change. So, you know, I've got this gradient flow, which is um, um, from um, on a fast time scale, just flowing down the landscape down the landscape. But at the slow level, the landscape is itself now changing all the time. So I'm perpetually chasing minima um, and moving minima because the gradients themselves are contextualized and are changing slowly. So you get this deep structure to the temporal dynamics, um, which has this very non-Markovian aspect. So now we've got this interesting picture where things like you and me that are big, 
where big just means that there are lots of Markov blankets that, 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 that um, constitute my deep generative model um, that enable this um, separation of time scales. Um, you've got this picture um, where each level is now providing the landscape for the level below with very, very fast changes. But of course, these are now changing the, um, the, the, the landscape is, is, is itself changing so that now you've got a non-Markovian model of a universe that we know is Markovian. Um, so we know because we started, if you remember right at the beginning with this notion of a random dynamical system that is usually associated with uh, things like a Langevin equation or a, you know, a Markovian process. Um, so we're starting from a, a, a Markovian um, universe with effectively no memory. And now we've found things inside this universe that look as if they found a non-Markovian explanation, a coarse-grained, sense, um, sensible and sense-making explanation for their sensory impressions that is quintessentially non-Markovian, that has this deep temporal structure you know, of the kind you find in language. You know, the whole point of, say, for example, um, you know, hierarchical Dirichlet um, um, process models of natural language right through to the uh, current focus on transformer architectures in large language models. They're all about breaking the Markovian. Um, they're all about finding non-Markovian explanations for what at the end of the day must be uh, you know, a, uh, a, Marco a Markovian process. And you may ask, well, where does that come from? Well, um, if we spend most of our time trying to model um, input, where that input is generated by things like us, and we are complex, deep things that generate non-Markovian actions, then in fact, our universe now becomes non-Markovian simply because we have other things in it that are sufficiently big to have these deep generative models. And then you get into language and, and communication and uh, you know, the itinerancy, which is, I think, quite unique to us. Uh, you know, I don't think you'll find this kind of dynamics if you get too big. Um, and certainly, as we've already discussed, it, it can't exist at a very microscopic scale. So even in your head, um, your macromolecules in the 16th um, dendrite in the CA1 field of your left hippocampus, that doesn't do any planning. It's too small. Uh, it doesn't have that requisite depth of, or nesting of Markov blankets. Um, uh, so small stuff can't do, can't have this separation of temporal scales and this particular deep itinerancy and um, sort of, um, you know, Markovian breaking like property. Um, but interestingly, when you get too big, um, you also can't do it either. So you, you know, the, the motion of the heavenly bodies, the uh, the moon and the, and, and the sun and the like, they don't plan. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to ask, well, why not? Well, because they don't have, um, because a lot, effectively, because they're so big, all the random fluctuations in their world have gone away. And you now um, are left with classical mechanics. So, you know, you could sort of get deterministic chaos in n-body problems, but there wouldn't be a description um, that would um, be usefully interpreted in terms of planning as inference or active inference in the way that we've been talking about. So I think there's a Goldilocks regime. You've got to be big enough, but not too big uh, mm. to do this uh, to do this kind of planning. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's bringing up all of these existential, potentially fluffy questions in my mind, um, which I, I, I would like to sort of ask at least one, which is, we could ask why let's take the macro structures the celestial bodies black hole the universe itself we could ask why why in a mechanistic mathematical sense do they not um have this kind of non-markovian temple or horizon so there's a mathematical answer to that which or a physical physical in the sense of being explained by physicists there's an answer to that there isn't necessarily an existential answer to that um, and I guess 
I, I do not expect a concrete answer because I'm sure there isn't one, but millennia has been dedicated to the question of the human condition and, and why maybe that itinerancy is so fundamentally defining of our nature, which is that we can't seem to kind of sit still. We, we are open and the world is affecting us and we're affecting the world, as you said, and we're in this constantly dynamic coupling. I guess I would love to just hear intuitive thoughts that you might have on why the universe would unfold in such a way that you do have a Goldilocks zone. Um, why, why is it the case that things like us n have this wandering openness rather than just being um, either in the soup or being firmly rigid forever? If you have any thoughts on that. Um, you are, yeah, uh, not well formed thoughts, um, but I mean, it is a fascinating thing to reflect upon. Um, I, I think the answers that, that someone like me would give you would inherit from a uh, sort of um, a classical view of um, physics as opposed to a, a quantum information theoretic view. Uh, so you may get a very different answer if you ask somebody like. Um, um, Carlo Ravelli or Stephen Wolfram or um, you know my friend Chris uh, Fields, um, but if you're happy with a sort of um, 101 physicist's response uh, to that, um, the way that I would look at that is through the lens of the renormalization group, which just says that there, the um, the, the th things exist at different scales and there is a um, you are um, looking for uh, explanations of those that, that that scale free behavior in terms of laws that are dynamics or lagrangians technically um, uh, that are conserved um, over different levels and for, for the free energy principle that is just the um, the dynamics the gradient flow on the um, uh, on the free energy defined at each level or each scale um, and that leads you to then a view of um, the same kind of things sorry the same kind of processes and the same principles applying at each and every scale of the universe so that you would at a very very fine time scale and a very very fine um, um, spatial scale, say in the quantum scale, you would have uh, lots of very, very fast hot stones moving around uh, where the random fluctuations predominate. Um, and there is very little of this kind of long term itinerancy. Um, now, technically, that results from um, um, some uh, a certain aspect of the way that you can always decompose any dynamics any gradient flow so i've spoken um about the dynamics exclusively in terms of gradient flows flowing down um the uh, flowing down the uh, the, the uh, free energy landscape say on a cyclical manifold being my sort of favorite picture of that um that denies a really another really important aspect of the flow which is the flow orthogonal to that gradient flow uh, known as solenoidal flow or divergence free flow um, so the way that i look that, that i look at this um through the lens of a sort of classical physicist that that would predicate everything on this random dynamical system or langevin approach um is that you've got a continuum between ver the very small and the very big where now we're not talking so much um, about sort of the, the degree of nesting of Markov blankets, but simply the, um, the, the contribution of random fluctuations to the dynamics. Um, and the important thing to bear in mind is that there is uh, any dynamics, any flow has this solenoidal part, this conservative part, and this dissipative part that it inherits from the random fluctuations. So if you're very very small then all the random fluctuations have not yet been averaged away and the dissipative part predominates over the conservative part the solenoidal part um, which means that at the very very small scales you are effectively in the world of um, thermodynamics where you're effectively ignoring 
the uh, the solenoidal part. Um, so everything is dissipated. You get fluctuation dissipation theorems, um, you know, um, uh, integral fluctuation theorems, uh, you know, and, and, and then you can drive generalizations of the second law and, and all of that good stuff. Um, and then as we as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, the what, the core screening implicit in the um, what's known as a, a, um, an RG operator in the renormalization group sort of. You, I look at it as a sort of grouping and dimension reduction. A coarse graining uh, or entails an averaging, and as you average, the random fluctuations average out to zero. So now the the dissipative part disappears, and you're just left with a solenoidal flow, which is just the conservative dynamics of Newtonian mechanics and Lagrangian mechanics, and the solenoidal aspect is just a description of the, like the moon going around the Earth and the Earth going around the Sun. It's things that have orbits, stable orbits or quasi-periodic um, um, orbits that are approaching deterministic simply because they are very, very big. So the interesting thing happens in the middle where you've got a mixture of dissipative uh, dynamics and conservative dynamics. What would the conservative dynamics look like? Well, they would look like this sort of um, itinerant um, um, uh, oscillation. It would look like the same kind of uh, classical conservative oscillation that the moon does, but it will be much more itinerant. It'll look like a, 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 you know, a, um, a biorhythm. It will look like a life cycle. It will look, it will have that property that we associate with living movement. So, you know, we talked before about the fact to, to, um, to be autonomous is to move, it is to have active states. One would also argue that movement in and of itself is not sufficient. You know, the moon moves, um, the oceans move. Um, are they biotic in their self-organization? I think you'd be looking now for a special kind of movement which emphasizes this solenoidal, a mixture of solenoidal and dissipative, uh, dis dissipative dynamics. Um, so sandwiched in between the very big and the very small is a Goldilocks regime, where indeed you do have this opportunity for the biotic kind of self-organization that characterizes our existence, that is um, not only um, manifest in terms of uh, delicately crafted solenoidal diversion three dynamics, but also nested at different timescales. So just think about all the different timescales that you're um, body entertains solenoidal dynamics, um, um, rotational dynamics from the fast gamma oscillations again in that uh, hippocampal neuron through to um, your um, cardiac cycle, through to your respiratory cycle, through to the, your diurnal cycles, through to your um, um, slower cycles, right through to your life cycle. Uh, and so on and so forth, and then you know, take it up to a, any scale you want. Um, but the key thing, the point being made here, is that not only do you have this admixture of dissipative gradient flows that underwrite self-evidencing, this is in the context of this solenoidal flow at multiple scales, at nested scales. So again, we come back to this, uh, this deep nesting. Um, so on that view, there will be a Goldilocks regime, and of course, it is only at that in that regime will you ever get systems that start to self-model and communicate and co-construct their their niches. Will you get cultural niche construction? Will you get the kind of will you get language and will you, will you have conversations like this? It's not going to happen um, at the level of uh, uh, macromolecules or cells, and it's not going to happen at the level of heavenly bodies. But it will happen at our level um, um, uh, and clearly has happened if I can believe my senses yeah I guess the yes I guess the f I mean my follow up my my inevitable follow up would be why are there these different sizes but I don't I don't want to get into that because then it's just turtles all the way down about why I <laughs> well no no do, do. Do, 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 I mean, we, we can bring it to close very quickly, but that's it. It is turtles all the way down. That's, I, I, I think, a fundamental insight. 
uh, and once you once you commit to that, everything starts to make a lot more sense. So, um, you know, just in terms of um, you know how long will my Markov blanket last? Well, it will last the, you know for a long time at my temporal scale, but the um, the scale above um, will last much longer. So I have an environment and a niche that lasts longer than I do, and my body lasts longer than any one cell, and my cell lasts lasts longer than any one intercellular component, and uh, you know that, that component will last longer than any particular macromolecular uh, configuration. So, uh, so it is all the way down, and you need it at each level. You have to have the context being a thing, having its own Markov blanket at its scale in order to um, provide the context for the faster coming and going of Markov blankets at the lower scale. But in the same sense, because the larger scale inherits from the dynamics of the lower scale, there's a, a circular causality, which people like George Ellis would cast in terms of top-down and bottom-up causation. Put simply, what that means is I cannot exist. Well, let's put it another way my hippocampal cell cannot exist unless my brain is in good shape my brain mm. cannot be in good shape unless i'm doing good active inference and, and relating correctly within my family and my conspecifics my conspecifics cannot uh, work uh, exist unless there is um, a biosphere that sustains that kind of life the biosphere cannot exist and, and so on and so forth all the way up and all the way down at every level there are things and those things have to have Markov blankets. And at every level, they can be construed as doing some kind of elemental inference uh, or self-evidencing. Um, the, the story we're telling, though, is the special kind of self-evidencing that comes out at a particular scale. But the existence of that scale requires exactly the same, um, I repeat, from the perspective of the renormalization group, it requires exactly the same dynamics or Lagrangian or functional form of the dynamics um, at, uh, you know, at, at every level. And you know, on this view, because the explanatory target of the free energy principle is basically relational, it's trying to understand self-organization um, of a thing that can be individuated um, in this context and in terms of what it is contextualizing. It, it's a very myopic um, ambition. It doesn't describe you know cosmology or um, you know, the, the, the universe, uh, you're not going to get electromagnetism from the free energy principle. Um, uh, um, uh, and so it doesn't really have to worry about when does this, you know, when, what is the largest scale, or what is the smallest scale, you can keep on going all the way down. And if you had to hedge your bets, because I guess it is a hedge better, bet, bet hedger, rather, um, does it stop? Does, does the, does, is it, or is it just it just goes on Markov blankets on Markov blankets. Yes, yes, mathematically, yes. Yeah, there is. Yeah, it's a little bit like you ask me, uh, where's the um, um, where's the edge of the Earth? When does the Earth stop? <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah, if you, if you if you're committed to the renormalization group, um, no, it just keeps on going forever. Um, that. Um, I, I, and you sort of, yeah, I, I'm quite comfortable with that because, um, you know, it, it emerges from a sort of um, a question, which is, what is a state? So we've been talking glibly about state spaces, statistical manifolds and states of affairs that we, and, and hidden states and latent states. Um, to have a state space and particularly to, uh, and specifically to have a um, a, a state space that, be, that can be interpreted or construed as a statistical manifold. You have to have states, but what, what, where do states come from? Uh, and the argument, sorry, I should ask you. The, <laughs> the, argument is, the argument is that they are the states of things. Where do things come from? Oh, we just said it's a partition of state space. Well, where do the states come from? Um, if you try to answer that question, um, then you all you have to do is basically um, de determine the mapping between um, things or particles and states. And the answer is quite simple. It is, it is basically one way of looking at this sort of, um, or using the apparatus, apparatus of the renormalization group, that um, the, the, the state of a thing is the uh, state of its Markov blanket states. Um, and 
then the um, the the then that state itself now has a Markovian or a a, a partition into Markov blankets. So you now get blankets of blankets, um, and so that you can resolve the paradox or the um, the, the catch twenty two. Yeah, you know, what's the state of something? Well, what's a thing? Well, a, a thing is, is determined by uh, conditional independence among the states. Uh, you know, you can resolve that infinite regress just by saying it is just a recursion. That you know, states at one level inherit the averages of the Markov blanket states of things at the next level, but the, at every level there are things. So you have this. Um, you know, you just keep on going down. I should say. Um, you know, there are people who believe that um, there is a smallest scale or it is sufficient. I'm not absolutely sure about this, but if you ever get the chance in later life, if you can talk to, uh, again, people like Carlo Rovelli or S Stephen Wolfram, um, you know, from the point of view of quantum loop gravity and from the point of view of the Rouliad, um, then there, you know, the, the, there is this notion that there is some irreducible um, um, smallness scale uh, beyond which you can't go, and then the game is how do you get a continuous world out of this sort of quantum, discrete, um, um, very very small description of things. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Strange loops makes me think of Hofstadter and strange loops. Also makes me think slightly of the um, holographic principle. What you just mentioned there about projections onto the screen. Um, th this this notion of um, reading off the Markov blanket. You said something that I said we had three things that I wanted to talk about, um, and we covered temporality, albeit over a long temporal scale. I wanted to very quickly ask you mentioned um, in passing um, about celestial bodies being nearly deterministic, and my ears pricked up. Um, I, on an internalist model of the free energy principle, I sense that there's actually a kind of licensing for free will because we have this internal model and we act upon the world as to confirm the model that we we wish to we wish to observe on an externalist perspective where we really are no different from another physical entity except for the fact that we have the possibility of moving things and and acting to to self-evidence there isn't so much space for free will but my ears pricked up when you spoke about agency and when you spoke about the celestial bodies being nearly deterministic because it makes me think it seems to imply, at least uh, heuristically, that being open to the environment, being an itinerant being, licenses agents, agency. But I want to make sure that this is true metaphysical agency in the sense of n not hard determinism. Um, or whether this is agency in the sense of self-conception as a free agent, because those are two different things. Um, it's we, we won't be denying that we perceive ourselves to be free. I guess the, fun, the more fundamental question there is whether that's an illusion or not. And so I was wondering whether free energy principle has anything to say about a kind of libertarian versus deterministic perspective on free will. Um. Well, I mean, you, you could certainly use the the the, the, um, the free energy principle to, to tell stories that speak to th those arguments, um, and I think you picked up on some you know some of the key parts of those stories. Um, so you know, deterministic chaos that you get with n body problems when thinking about some sort of massive bodies um, dancing around each other. Um, you know, there is still chaos in mix in the mix. Um, so there's an unpredictability and sensitivity to initial conditions in in the good old fashioned way of um, non-linear dynamical system theory of a deterministic sort. Um, but once you get to um, th you know things like you and me, um, you're really in the world of stochastic chaos. So you've the stochastic bit inheriting from the uh, the random fluctuations, where you've got um, two kinds of um, if you like or two aspects of uncertainty and implicitly then in, in modeling that uncertainty um, um, uh, the opportunity to talk about sort of free will uh, and selection um, one interesting twist here is that the um, if you watch you want to apply the free energy principle as a principle of least action to things like you and me um, what you have to um, um, imagine 
is that we are deterministic things in a stochastic and chaotic world. Um, so in making sense of things, we only do so at a particular scale. We're talking before about the averaging away, when I'm sufficiently big to average away my random fluctuations. Under the free energy principle, that literally means you have to take the average of lots of neurons. So the kind of sense making, the kind of uh, dynamics that you would simulate under the free energy principle applies to and only to the ensemble behavior where you can average away any of the stochastic aspects. Mm. So you will not get, you will not be able to deduce evidence or um, um, solicit uh, or um, find evidence for the free energy principle by looking at single neural or single synaptic. It has to be at the, the ensemble level where the, the um, well, there are all sorts of arguments why that has to be the case. But um, from, from our point of view, it's when the random fluctuations are averaged away. Um, so uh, I'm just qualifying what I'm saying is I'm not saying that the brain is uh, stochastic or uh, shows stochastic chaos. What I'm saying is that the brain has to provide an apt explanation or approximation um, to explain stochastic chaos. Um, and crucially, um, the um, stochastic chaos associated with our own behavior, um, with the consequences of our own actions. So you've got a deterministic system trying to now model a non-deterministic stochastic chaotic system. And, and you know, in so doing, well, and that's easy to do because, of course, we're, we're talking about um, that modeling being in terms of belief or probability distribution. So that, that's absolutely no problem. Um, so um, on that view, I think you could easily motivate um, free will of a certain kind um, in the sense that you, when, uh, when you're planning, you have effectively to select amongst different models of the future. And technically, this would be Bayesian model selection. And selection is an act. And so again, we have a different kind of agency here, but it has, it's a kind of agency inherent in the selection amongst competing plans or policies, uh, narratives, paths to the, into the future, um, that I think has all the space to um, um, say that this, and it's you doing the choosing. Remember, you can't, there's nothing on the outside that can influence directly that choice on the inside. So from your point of view, you certainly have free will. Would it look like you have free will from the outside? Um, um, I think that's a more vexed question. Uh, of course, you'll never know, but but uh, I think you'd you'd probably you'd be in the game of of, of a game. Practically, how I spend most of my um, um, day job is inferring to what extent is this artifact or this person um, doing good um, planning as inference, good planning. Um, you know, for example, if somebody's in a coma or in a vegetable or asleep or has a psychiatric disorder, um, you know, you, you need to know to what extent they are um, and in what way they are self-modeling. Um, so, you know, um, this is a slightly sort of clinical and abstract example, but it illustrates the point that you will never know whether something has free will. All you can do is infer that they are behaving as if they had a generative model that entailed a self model and um, uh, and thereby a model of the consequences of action and therefore as if they were a true agent and possibly they may know they're a true agent they may not you know they may be again um, you know that would require another level of, of of the Markov blanket is that what you had in mind yes I mean I think um I guess the, the the kind of hardline determinist response would always be pushing you to say whether that organism or particle could have done otherwise. So it may have this reflexive quality of, okay, I'm doing Bayesian model selection to my sense of self, and we will come to consciousness because I think that's the kind of crux of this issue is why is any of this happening online anyway? But it, it, it might have this self... Um, reflexive notion of being a free agent but the hardline determinist from the kind of external position of physics might always say well could that bundle of atoms ever have done otherwise in terms of its bayesian model selection but it's it's again it it, it might just be one of these sort of 
loops that just keep spinning. Um, yeah, it, it's it's all um, fascinating. I had a question that I've just popped out of my head when I was talking about free will, which was... Um, I will come back to it. I will, it will come back to me. Um, consciousness. I know it's... I don't know if it's being considered... A, I don't know if we can call it a red herring yet in um, the academic world because it's become a very hot topic um and people are getting very heated about it and there's no need to bring up particular examples of when people have got heated about it but people are very invested in their theories and i guess rightly so it, it seems to be this one thing that people can't seem to couch within their theories of everything if they have one do you let's starting with a very simple question do you consider it to be a real problem do you take something like the hard problem seriously, or for you is it more of a meta question, or can it, or does a deflationary account just do the job in terms of the hard problem? Um, it really depends who I'm talking to, as my friend Jeff Beck would say. It depends which pants I'm wearing. So yeah, I think I think very much it's it, it's a question of um, a conversation, and you have to you have to infer how much investment the person you're talking about has in this issue and what position they're taking. Um, and I mean that you know, just in terms of being polite and engaging you know, with integrity in scientific uh, debate or indeed philosophical debate. But I also mean it uh, in a slightly more fundamental way that consciousness is, uh, is an illusion. Um, and, but, and I think illusions are fantastic. They're literally fantasies. And I think that's what makes our brains fantastic organs. I think they're hypotheses. I think that the, the illusion is um, the thing that we, uh, that we test. It is the thing that generates the predictions in predictive processing. So I think consciousness is another illusion, um, very much along the lines that uh, one reading of Andy Clark's Basin Qualia paper um, um, that even qualitative experience qualia are just illusions. They're just things, they're just constructs we bring to the table, including selfhood. Um, they're just hypotheses, illusions that are particularly apt at um, explaining everything that we sense and making good sense of it as, as a, a parsimonious hy hypothesis. Consciousness itself, I think, is exactly that because it only applies, the hypothesis is that um, is this thing conscious or not only applies because there are other things in my universe that I'm trying to have to model like you. So it's, the question is not whether I am conscious. The question is whether you are conscious. And of course, we've already said that is unanswerable because you have a Markov blanket. So it's an unanswerable an question, but crucially, it's a question about the things I observe that I'm trying to make sense of. Um, it only becomes, I think, um, only in, in the spirit of the meta hard problem or the meta problem. Um, it only becomes um, um, vexed when you make the mistake of asking, am I conscious? Uh, as I don't think that's what the question is there for. That's not, the illusion is not for me. It's for you. Uh, the illusion is the consciousness is a construct, a hypothesis, and a very plausible one and all the evidence uh, that I have at hand would suggest that you are con uh, conscious and indeed literally because there is that evidence um, it is there in the sense of an evidence maximizing illusion or hypothesis or component of my generative model um, so I I go through that just to make it clear that the, you know, the answer depends upon who you're talking to but also who you're trying to um, ascribe consciousness to so if I was talking to um, um, well, if I was talking to um, people uh, like Jacob Howey, um, um, you know, uh, the first thing he'd say is that the free energy principle is not a theory of consciousness. Uh, and in yeah. fact, he likes saying that every, every, at every opportunity. So, so there's nothing, there's nothing, um, <clears throat> there's nothing in the free energy principle that has anything explicit to say about explicit to say about consciousness. On the other hand, people have used it in different ways to uh, address the hard problem. Um, 
you could take the view that Andy Clark takes that there isn't a hard problem and perhaps even with David Chalmers's work recently on the meta problem the meta hard problem that's probably a more interesting problem um, or you could you could grasp the, the nettle and start to talk about it if, if you were talking to um, my colleagues uh, Chris Frith and and um, um, and um, Adam Saffron and Maxwell Ramstead and, and you know, uh, whole, I won't list them, but um, certainly, um, so I think inspired uh, uh, by something that you mentioned a little, uh, earlier on, which is the holographic principle in, um, um, in, in quantum information theory, where the holographic screen now um, plays the role of, of the Markov blanket that separates the inside and the outside in terms of bulk reading and writing to um, the, um, the um, the, the holographic screen um if you're talking to him um then he would start to talk about these minimal screens uh these minimal markov blankets um and develop quite a quite a sort of nice argument that if you can't reduce in the sense that we're talking about nested markov blankets inside a markov blanket if there are no more reductions at hand then the only way that the internal states of that irreducible Markov blanket can know about their own existence is by acting upon lower levels, and therefore there's some um, there's something unique. There there exists a unique Markov blanket that that, that you know, um, maybe um, uh, have the attribute of of consciousness. Um, if you're talking to somebody like uh, Vanya Weiss. Um, um, he would uh, you know, tackle this in terms of um, trying to resolve uh, a dualistic position by offering a dual aspect monism um, uh, of a Markovian sort, and that rests very heavily upon this information geometry. So if you remember before, we're talking about sort of a state space equipped with free energy functionals um, on it um, um, that um, plays the role of a Siskel manifold, but but there are two Siskel manifolds that are jointly sit up, uh, sit in this in the same state space of say neural activity. One is that for any given uh, point, there is a probability of being there from a po point of view of neural activity and the thermodynamics. So this would be a thermodynamic um, kind of information geometry. And then the other one is what the free energy principle uses, which is the encode using that point to encode beliefs about external states. So you've got two um, information geometries, belief structures, if you like, um, that supervene on exactly the same uh, material um, process. One of which is pertains to probability distributions or beliefs about the internal states, and the other one is probability distributions or beliefs encoded by the internal states about the external states. So you could construe one as being the mental and one as being the material. And then you've got this dual aspect monism where you're now asking questions about, well, what are the lawful relationships between the thermodynamic free energy and the, um, the, um, the variational free energy that pertains to beliefs about things? So you've got now a mechanics that talks about beliefs and that may well be one way of repairing that sort of uh, a, a dualistic approach um, there's another uh, another perspective which you would get if you were talking to uh, talking uh, to people like um uh, Giulio Tononi and um Cyril um uh, the, well my colleagues involved in a, one of the Templeton Foundation uh, Abyssal research uh, um collaborations um, where you're trying to find bright lines between the free energy principle and inf integrated information theory, um, um, w which is not necessarily the best thing to do because a lot of integrated information theory is exactly consilient with the free energy principle. However, if you are going to get funded uh, by uh, trying to tease them apart, then the thing that distinguishes those approaches to um, uh, consciousness is really the uh, uh, the active part that we're talking about. So uh, boiling this down in a way that somebody like I repeat Jakob Howie might might articulate this is it's the difference between seeing and looking. Yeah, to be conscious, I have to look. It's not enough to see. 
Um, it's, um, you know, to be conscious, I have to listen. It's not enough to hear. Uh, so you're putting action into games. There's active sensing, this, in, this sort of closing the, the, the loop between the inside and the outside. Maybe um, the thing that um, is necessary for consciousness and simply because you're saying that consciousness is an attribute of agents and agents have to act what do they act on their sensations what does that mean they they do active sensing so to be an agent is to be an active sensor yes do active inference um and you know if you're saying that things that aren't agents can be conscious then you wouldn't worry about that but if you are committed to a deep um to the notion that to be conscious um of to have a minimal selfhood um then you have to have the notion of self if you have to have the notion of self then you have to be an agent if you have to be an agent you have to um, um have generative models about the consequences of your agency your actions uh and that has to have the temp and then we go through the all of those nice links that we were talking about before with temporality and uh, and uh, you know and the like and indeed the hierarchical structure that takes us back to the chris fields um irreducible um uh, holographic screen or or um or markov blanket so that would be the way that i would um converse with that crowd uh, uh uh, I've run out of, yes, I've run out of people that I might talk about it. Uh, so I have to find out what you like, and then I'd uh, I'd tell a story that that you like, or let you tell a story that uh, that you like. Well, I guess my question to you would be: Can you imagine a world of self-evidencing? Can you imagine? Okay, let's put it another way: Can you imagine a perfect replica world like ours, where the lights are turned off? entirely there is no consciousness or is it do you imagine it's a necessary uh consequence of the way that creatures are like uh, like us are structured that to do t deep temporal planning to do planning as inference whatever it is or self-hooding we need consciousness could there have been another way that the universe would have unfolded without us being online um, I suspect not. Um, sorry, I, I, I'm torn between um, um, being taken by you down sort of you know philosophical zombie uh, routes versus um, another um, story that comes out in the free energy principle about consciousness, which is um, the, um, the 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 importance of self modeling in relation to other modeling and the fact that we are actually living in a world um of things like us so you know, and one story i didn't cover which is a story you would t tell if you were talking to um my friend chris frith or people who are much more interested in the sort of social neuroscience and uh, or say attachment theory um and you know neurodevelopmental issues um that are induced by a sort of evolutionary psychology view or niche construction for example all of these views of consciousness means that consciousness is just there um which is where i started to infer um the state the disposition the intentions state of mind of somebody else um why and how can you do that well you can only do that if that thing is sufficiently like you to be able to use your generative model um, as uh, of say your physical actions as a model of their physical actions to infer their intentions and the like um, and when one takes that to its limit then um, often what the real problem is is not in terms of inferring the content of some communication or some uh, uh, exchange of, of, of um, semiotic cues it really is inference about agency again it's did you do that or did i do that so that ambiguity now requires you to have a model of self versus other so it's a much more relational um, um notion of self so you know sometimes i think people talk about minimal selfhood um as something which is monolithic i don't think that's necessary as part of a gentle model it certainly would be important to have um different um different kinds of self you know, am I embarrassed? Am I in love? You know, as we were talking about, in, you know, in the um, 
TMB meeting a few days ago. Yeah. Um, that would be you know, an expressive and very necessary part of generative model where I have to contextualize my own emotional and pro-social and autonomic and motoric behaviors. Um, but there's no one self, it's a self, it, you know, the self like this, like this and like this. A more fundamental relationship, uh, relational aspect of selfhood is in relation to otherhood. You know, mm. mum, um, you know, versus me, and am I mum, or is, you know, um, is, is, is mum a thing? Am I a thing? Mm. Uh, I'm the same thing as mum. You know, he's going to sort of Klein in um, uh, um, sort of um, uh, arguments there. So, put simply, what that means is it may well be only in universes or worlds that are populated by ensembles of conspecifics that are sufficiently similar would you need selfhood simply to distinguish self from other in a universe where there's only me i wouldn't need selfhood so it would not be it would not pay its way in terms of model complexity or model evidence to have the notion of me being a self if there's only me it only pays its way if i now have to actually entertain the hypothesis that either i cause that or you cause that. So the question now is, is it inevitable that you get a universe with lots of similar things emerging, all disambiguating themselves or uh, attributing agency to themselves in the, yeah. Goldilocks, uh, in the yeah. Goldilocks zone? I think it probably is. I think that would be, I think if you simulated sufficiently accurately artificial life, I think you would, you would get the emergence of um, populations of similar things and that they would niche construct um, and they would be thereby drive their own um, uh, sort of nest increasingly nested and um, structurally complicated um, or at least sparsely um, structured um, uh, organizations in terms of their Markov blankets um, and that this would um, this at some point would inevitably invoke um, modeling of others and therefore almost by default uh, a, 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 a minimal notion of, uh, of, self, of, of selfhood. I think that would be emergent, uh, you know, um, but it would require being in the Goldilocks re regime for a sufficient amount of time for this kind of niche construction uh cultural niche construction to actually play out so you know you'd have to have this very slow time scale providing the right kind of context for this this kind of thing to uh, think to emerge yeah yeah i think my well i have some i think i have some sympathies to the to the argument that chalmers would have laid out in or did lay out in 95 in his original hard problem paper which is that i think i can still ask the further question which is can systems like me make the functional distinction between myself and others without there being a sense of what it's like to be me? Can that just be an offlineness, which is done purely in some algorithmic manner, which need not involve some qualia of myselfness? So, yeah, there, there's a point that there's an element in me where I don't want to say that that, in a sense, resolves a hard problem because at least I can hypothetically envision that being done offline. Um, I wonder whether you've given much thought to Mark Soames's idea, which is that consciousness might be rooted in affect, because this seems to me to be a bit more of a self-confirming idea, which is that feelings must be felt. Now, I think there's still an open question there, which is affect arises at the point of uncertainty uh, and drives us to resolve uncertainty. And when we do so, we feel good about ourselves. Now, again, I still think when I was reading his book, I still had this open question. Well, why would that have to, why would, why would affect even emerge in that place? Why wouldn't we just have this drive to resolve that uncertainty without there being the onlineness? So at least for me, although I may be wrong, and I'm very happy to be wrong, there is still no simple parsimonious explanation which can get around this, um, this point that Chalmers makes, which is you can give me the function, but you still, you, you can't give me the explanatory power why it needs to be online. Um, and I wonder if there ever will be some mechanism which is sufficiently, which isn't just purely tautological or invokes consciousness as some fundamental reality.
which makes me which makes me wonder whether you've heard of Donald Hoffman, whether you're familiar with his work. I it, yes. Because I sense that in some ways it has some interesting implications, maybe for the free energy principle in the sense of space and time not being fundamental units of reality. We've been speaking a little bit about how um, where do space and time come from? How much do space and time overlap in the sense of generating, um, like we need expans expansive creatures like us with embedded Markov blankets inevitably have a sense of temporal modeling and there's these interesting interactions. Does the idea of space and time being what he would say applications on a desktop does that have any real, do you sense has any real ontological implications for the free energy principle or is it a red herring? Um, well, you've, you've introduced two important things. I forgot to mention Mark Soames as another friend. Yeah. So if I was talking <laughs> to Mark Soames, I would say it's all about this irreducible Markov blanket that acts upon the rest of the brain, whereas that action it's going to be in the neuromodulatory systems that set the precision. The precision is exactly that Fisher metric which tells you about how much you're updating your beliefs. It is the way that you do mental action. It is, as you intimated, um, feeling in the sense that it is quintessentially balanced by increasing or decreasing the precision or uncertainty. So uh, the, you know, that's how I would... Uh, tie in Mark's um, formulation to, to, which I think is internally consistent with, um, say, Chris Field's formulation or um, uh, Vanya's uh, formulation. So Mark so, uh, focuses you know, on, on us, I think, a key aspect of, um, of active inference, which is, uh, if you're a psychologist, it will be attention. It's basically acting in a way on the inside to um, get the an estimate and deploy the right confidence or the right precision in um, um, mathematically the curvature of the uh, of, of the um, the free energy in and of itself um, getting that right um, and um, you know that has a lovely you know connection to attention it means that you can't divorce um, consciousness from attention you can't divorce it from agency in the sense of mental action or internal action you now have a deep connection to um thomas metzinger's um the distinction between uh, you know um opaque and phenomenal transparency um and uh, and the way that mark would tell the story would be that this is just feeling and feeling is at the heart of, of any uh, qualitative experience um so uh, yeah Thank you for the for reminding me. He was one person I forgot to, to cover. Um, the uh, the second thing, um, you know, the the space and time being illusions. Um, I mean, yeah, I sort of start off there, so I, I, I'm not quite sure that it. Uh, so if you're saying that Donald's, um, and I should say he's a friend. I think I've never met him, but I think he's a friend of Chris Field and Mike Levin. So you know, the, 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 there's, there's a a small world here. Um, but if you're just saying that um, space and time are um, illusions in the sense that we were talking about illusions as being fantastic and the thing that makes us into fantastic little beings and have beings and um, uh, and our brain into a fantastic organ, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, the question for me is why on earth would you, um, what, what, what must be the case for us to have this illusion of space time and that we are living in a metric space and it's practically very important i mean a lot of people spend a lot of time in machine learning embedding things in metric spaces uh, and sometimes it's very difficult to see what licenses them to do that uh, you can certainly see how it would work in terms of projective geometries in metric spaces um, but the deep question is why you know, uh, you know i can't um, i can't imagine a um, you know, uh, an amoeba really having having a, a notion of, of, of uh, space. Um, I may be wrong, um, and so now, um, um, you know, if you listen to people like um, um, Stephen Wolfram, um, you know, the notion of space time um, itself may the illusion of space time itself may be just an artifact of the fact that our sensory organs respond very very slowly in relation to the speed of light so if light traveled very very slowly or imagine a world in which um, um, we saw with sound and sound was very 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 slow 
um, would that would that be would that give you the illusion of space um, uh, you know and, and distance at an action of the kind that you know, we sort of implicitly assume when we're talking about sort of visual objects so I think he has this nice notion that you know in this kind of world um, with these kinds of sense organs um, you know when something moves from here to here is it the same thing anymore because that's what you're saying when you have a metric space in which objects move um, you know some certain symmetries or invariances are inherit from the notion of movement in a metric space but that may well just be be, be, be a fantasy we've got gone, gone off qualitative experience and the hard problem yeah well no I mean, by the way it all it all ties back it's a beautiful it's 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 a very good question which is why would this why would space and time be a an in, the interface for us I guess that is the deep question um and yet it appears that, it, that at least it, 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 it is something, at least in conscious awareness. I did remember my question, and it actually feeds into the last couple of questions that I will have, which is you mentioned um, that you spend a lot of your time inferring in the technical and layman sense whether other people have, I think you said, good generative models. There's an interesting question here, I think, which which... I may have had intuitively when I started reading about active inference, which is, is there any such thing as good self-evidencing in the sense that I may, so, so a lot of, as of course, you know, as you wrote a lot of papers, a lot of psychiatric disorders and psychological disorders have been rooted in um, disruptions to precision weighting mechanisms, for example. Can we consider, are the words good, bad, optimal suboptimal are these useful terms in this context or is it that that individual has a set of priors which are different from you and i and everyone else and we all actually have a sense of we all have kind of different priors so all self-evidencing in unique ways and yet philosophical vagueness allows us to clump us together into a group is there such a thing as what it is to be a good self-evidence as a human with beyond beyond just a trivial point that we're not just dissipating into the the heat bath right yeah that's an excellent question um so i i think the answer to that is yes um but as you uh, correctly um pointed out it should be qualified by the um the complete class theorem so you you're clearly referring to the complete class theorem so it might be just wise to um just define what that means and the implications for discussions uh, of good and bad um, um, generative models. Um, so the complete class theorem, the way I like to summarize it, is that for any given pair of behaviors and loss functions, there exists some priors that render your behavior Bayes optimal, which means that there is always a description of every behavior as Bayes optimal under some priors. So in that sense, you can't be good or bad um, where the thing is basically your decisions because this inherits from basic decision theory. So it's, it's not quite as full as uh, active inference in accommodating um, information game. But um, within the, within the um, confines of basic decision theory, you can't, be, um, you can't be good or bad. You just have different priors. So you know, my favorite example is that you know if, if we were, all went to live on um, on Mars or a much heavier planet, people with Parkinson's disease would probably be much be uh, better, have better priors, <laughs> you know, uh, some personal priors in terms of dopamine deficits because you know they move more slowly and then sort of more, <laughs> more cautiously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think from the point of view of the complete cluster, I think it's important to bear that in mind. That, you know, there are just different priors, but I, I, I do think though that you can sort of just say, well, hang on a second. What about whether well, there are good and bad priors? And I think then we get into this, again, this hierarchical story, because, of course, as soon as you have a hierarchical generative model, there are no priors. You know, everything's an empirical prior. Everything can be contextualized. Everything is conditioned upon everything else, including your prize. And then you're just back into the um, into the game of self-evidencing. What is good self-evidencing? It's achieving a higher marginal likelihood of model evidence. Um, how would you do that? By finding the right prize. How would you do that? By learning. How do you do that by changing your model, whether it be basic model selection or structure learning? Um, how would you do that at an evolutionary scale? You do basic model selection with natural selection. So yeah, um, on that view, 
the log evidence as bounded by the free energy um, is just adaptive fitness, is how well your priors are adapted to this world you are trying to explain. So I think, yes, absolutely, you can, you can, you can be a good self-evidencer, you can be a bad self-evidencer. If you're in natural selection, um, that matters because if you're a bad self-evidencer, that means that you, you means won't be around um, in, the, um, in the next generation. So the marginal likelihood of you existing at an evolutionary time scale is low. So the, the your your evidence is also the probability that you will be found, exist. Mm. You, know, you will exist. So it's quite important to to get, get to be a good self evidencer, um, because that's your marginal likelihood of existing. Uh, and I've now slipped in a, another synonym, uh, synonym for um, free energy beyond. Um, prediction weighted prediction errors or beyond surprise or surprise or self-information beyond log evidence uh, it's also it's just it's called the log marginal likelihood it's the the likelihood of your sensory exchanges with your world your eco niche having marginalized out or averaged away all the unknowns which in this context are all the states out there you know, the, the, the hidden causes or the sorry the external states which you model in terms of hidden uh, in terms of hidden causes um so yeah I, I think it's very important to be good at bad at evidencing the measure of goodness or badness is just the marginal likelihood of the model evidence and the free energy there is nothing else um uh, if you're saying does that speak to some creatures that will be able to actually assess how good they are at self-evidencing, then yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, so people like uh, Matthias Joffoli uh, looked at this specifically from the point of view of emotion and developed a whole taxonomy of emotion in terms of um, rates of change of free energy. And you get into stories of slope chasing, uh, um, looking for gradients and gradients and gradients of uh, self-evidencing on the measurement of the goodness of self-evidence which is uh, which is which is the free energy um, more refined stories more recent stories um, would basically be looking at certain kinds of uncertainty um, being encoded explicitly in your generative model as underlying affect uh, particularly the the you know, the certainty about what you're going to do next for example then we get back to um, the story that Mark Soames would like to tell, which is um, the precision of your beliefs is the most, you know, the most important attribute that defines, um, you know, its valence and the, your your feeling at, at this sort of minimal effective level. Yeah, yeah. The complete class theorem is an interesting one because I think it leads people, it leads one into a poten these potential strange conclusions. Um, it makes me think of animals that commit suicide oddly so um i think sort of aphids might explode themselves in the context of a predator it, it, it ultimately comes back down to your model evidence i guess so i am the type of creature that will commit suicide if i'm in the presence of a, of a ladybug of course but then those kinds of examples i sense for me show that the words good or bad i'm just pushing a little bit back just intuitively the words good or back in 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 the form of uh continued existence slightly put the cart before the horse because who said that that's the imperative so if i existed in a world where my everyone's imperative was to no longer exist you know god forbid then that then i would be doing bad self evidencing on that standard if i didn't if i continued to persist so is there a point at which even the, yeah, like, do you see how, well, do you see that argument holding any water um, or is it just now we're just sorry, dissolving into semantics? Uh, well, no, no, I think, I think it's an interesting thing to, to, to contemplate. Uh, uh, you, 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 you're, you're basically, I think, undermining um, that particular argument by, uh, um, a proof uh, abductio absurdum. Um, so if you think you are the kind of thing that will uh, self-destruct or to vitiate or commit suicide, um, then uh, you can't exist because you've killed yourself. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would be extremely surprised um, if there were any um, 
common natural um, um, subhuman uh, artifacts that uh, kill themselves. I didn't know about the aphid example. I'm very, I mean, obviously, lemmings is, is the sort of popular culture one, but um, um, you, you know, I think they were extremely rare. And uh, you know, and then you have to understand the um, selection at an evolutionary or transgenerational level um, um, in order to apply the free energy principle. Um, but in, in you know. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I'm very mindful that you know, a couple of weeks ago I was asked to review a paper applying active influence to suicide, and it was a very artful paper. Um, and uh, I do remember thinking, and I'm not sure whether the point was made implicitly or explicitly in the paper, but I, it, you know, it's, it made me think in the, exactly the way that you were you were um, talking about, um, you know the imperatives to survive and, and are, are they the right way to think about the causes of our behavior? Um, I, I would say absolutely not. Not uh, This is not about um, wanting to survive. This is simply wanting to avoid uncharacteristic sensations. And then we put a post hoc hypothesis, oh, that's because I want to survive then. Right. Uh, and that's a fantasy. That's another illusion. Uh, so you know, we do not know what it is like to be dead. So yes. it cannot be, but it can be surprising, but it certainly can't be the kind of surprise that you'd register in terms of a free energy. So it's not that we're frightened of being dead. It's mm. we're frightened of, um, we are going to avoid via these pragmatic constraints um, states that we have inherited that um, for, portend um, cessation and dissipation and death. Death in, in all itself is not at all frightening. We go to sleep every every um, uh, you know, suspension of cotton. We go to sleep every every night. Um, so you know, I I, I would I would um, uh, sorry. Yeah, and the final point I think is I think what you were doing though you, you were probably um, creating a slightly vexed and self defeating argument by saying. Uh, by assuming that um, we can understand things in terms of imperatives. The whole point of the free energy principle is that there aren't any imperatives. Mm. This is where it starts. It says, things that exist must behave like this. And part of the behaving like this means that you can interpret them as optimizing something and complying with imperatives. But that's just an interpretation that you'll bring to the table when you apply it to something else. If you then apply it to yourself, then yeah, then, then things might get interesting. You might have hard problems, but there are no imperatives. You know, in fact, even minimizing free energy is not an imperative. You can have the free energy principle applying to um, things that have very um, dissipated, uh, dissipated, attracting sets um, that have very, very um, high entropy. Um, all it's saying is that there has to be a certain uh, gradient flow. That counters the random fluctuations. Then you ask yourself, well, hang on a second. So why does it look as if we're always trying to attain some very precise homeostasis? Um, and the free energy principle would turn that on its head. It would say, well, look, okay, in some universes there may be very precise things, um, and these precise things, what would they look like? Oh, it would look as if they were trying that they, they, they had. Um, aspirations to uh, ev ev evincing a very precise homeostasis and indeed allostasis. So you get this notion of another kind of natural thing, which are precise things. Um, so if precise things exist, it would look as if they're, um, they are um, compelled to comply to very specific imperatives. But from a mm. free energy point of view, it's not saying they exist because they comply with the imperative. It's saying existence implies that it looks as if they have this imperative. Right. Now, and one final point. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware that we've, we've now approaching three hours. <laughs> uh, one final point, though. I, you introduced the word optimization. I think that was... Uh, uh, um, the right, uh, uh, right, and Im uh, important um, um, thing to introduce, because you know, the, it's only when you bring free energy into the game as a bound on marginal likelihood or self, the negative log marginal likelihood, which is self information or surprise or surprise or, do you convert an existential description into an optimization problem? So that's exactly the move that Richard Feynman made when he introduced variation free energy. He had this impossible marginalization problem that, to actually evaluate the marginal likelihood of paths. 
So exactly the same kind of problem that we're talking about in, in terms of uh, what are my priors over policies and plans and paths into the future. Um, you can't you can't evaluate that exhaustively. It's analytically and practically, physically not realizable. So the marginalization problem, the true inference problem, if you like, uh, the true existential uh, problem, if there is one, um, cannot be solved. But what you can do is introduce this bound and turn it into an optimization problem. So just by using free energy, um, or just by appealing to this uh, teleology that comes from um, uh, predicating everything on this evidence lower bound, you are actually saying that it looks as if creatures that exist are optimizing something. What does it look as? What are they optimizing? It looks as if they're optimizing a bound on their um, marginal likelihood or their adaptive fitness. Um, what does that look like? Well, it looks exactly like Bayesian inference. Uh, or if you're talking to somebody in machine learning, it would look as if you're um, optimizing your negative variation for energy, which is known as an elbow. So this is a evidence lower bound. It is exactly objective function used in um, sort of high-end uh, neural networks like variation autoencoders. Um, so, you know, I think the, the distinction between um, just being and optimizing is quite crucial. And you're absolutely right that once you make the move um, of um, framing things in terms of variational bounds using variational calculus or variational bays, um, then you have actually committed to an optimization narrative. But you don't, didn't have to. Just to exist, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you could... Uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to have this funky philosophical argument about needing to exist to predict, but I won't go there. I won't go there because um, we are going to wrap up. All of this philosophical, mathematical thoughts as, and consciousness thoughts has brought to my mind Thomas Nagel. Um, Thomas Nagel has this idea that death is bad because life is inherently good. And we've been talking about life and being and what it is to be and what one needs to do to be and persist to be if we're going to wrap everything up is there a sense in which that kind of related to what we were just talking about in terms of imperatives of course there is no imperative to be in any sense but you said it was an interesting thing you said there was it looks like we are all being anyway right even if we didn't have to it looks like we are there's no God granted plan for us to be, but we seem to be doing it anyway. Does any of Nagel's romantic I, philosophical idea that life is fundamentally good, being is good, does any of that resonate with you? Um, yes, it does because it's 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 you know it's nice, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and I think you'd, you'd probably it's nice. uh, you'd, you'd probably sort of license that with. with um, phrases of the kind that you know to exist is to be curious um so this speaks to this sort of um you know the ability to respond to um, epistemic affordances and certainly you know uh, to exist as curious creatures um mm -hmm. is obviously the good way to exist in you know in any given world and it's you know and would be mandated um I, I can't resist saying, though, of course, that this only really applies to you. It doesn't apply to me. So, so you are good because you are curious and you, you exist. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I could say the same for me, but I can't, strictly speaking. But you could if you wanted to. I could. I could abstract to you. It's not degree. I could infer that there is a you. Great. Um, and then I guess we can wrap it up there with one more question we've just spoken about life being good i'll flip the question i don't think i've ever heard you talk about death although we briefly touched upon it um i won't make it too personal but if life is kind of good in some sense because of the concomitant parts of living as we do as i don't know if it's good to be a stone but it's nice to be me having these conversations would that make death bad is there is there is there a is you said we fear dying because we fear in an affective sense um that which we don't expect to or the states we don't expect to embody 
And in some sense, we don't expect to embody death because it doesn't fit in with our priors. But beyond that free energy principle perspective, is there a broader position in which just returning back to the fabric of the universe is bad? Is there something to say about re-entering that Markov blanket? Does Do my Markov blankets dissipate? Um, what, what does that process look like? And, and does that strike fear in you or strike awe? Um, well, more awe, but I don't want to overstate it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is beautiful um, from a from a pure mathematical point of view. Um, so I I have a very sanguine view of this, and we've already said you know you've never been dead, I've never been dead, so no one can tell me it's an unpleasant uh, experience. Um, so I, I I'm not particularly I, I I'm not going to um, avoid being dead. I certainly think all the all the paths to being dead are pro probably very surprising and unpleasant. So I'm going to avoid those. Uh, um, death in and of itself, I don't think is uh, is, is is sort of um, quintessentially bad um in the same way that um navel being curious and being engaged with the world is a good is it is good while you exist um um, um i think that's perfectly okay uh, but i think death is you know um the, the life cycle let's call it a life cycle that, that it's slightly less uh, um, um uh, imbued with um, morbidity um the life cycle is, is is quite important because um if you just look at um if you just take this um multi-scale um um view of um self-organization cast in terms of this basic mechanics um that you know for example natural selection being basic model selection um then uh, if you put that together with what we we're talking about before about um ecosystems and niche construction constantly changing the lived world then what you need to do is to do constant Bayesian model selection um, in order to get the right structures very much in the spirit that we we're talking about before where there are good priors and there are bad priors in the sense of the marginal likelihood or adaptive fitness to learn those good priors, you sometimes have to start from scratch again um, with a different structure. And of course, this is exactly what Bayesian model selection does via structure learning at an evolutionary time scale will entail death. So that picture basically says that we have to keep refreshing, sort of sometimes cast in terms of base optimal forgetting. So we, the fact that we die our base is, is, is could be construed as a base optimal forgetting where we are the environment's memory of what is good for this eco niche. But the environment, or at least natural selection, knows that the environment is changing. So what was good last generation will not necessarily be good for the subsequent generation. So it has to forget in the same way that you learn by forgetting. You have insights by dispensing with redundant information. So in a sense, death, for in that life cycle is an essential part of um, uh, of the self-evidencing of the species. So it may be bad for you, I suppose, uh, you know, in a natal-esque sense, in that it's denying the opportunity to be curious and engaged with your lived world. But it's certainly good for your children and your children's children. Right, right, right. I'm a I'm a forewarning for them. That's good. I'm glad to I'm glad to be that pawn in that game. And a kind of cheery note on which to end, um, albeit slightly more morbid question. Carl, this was an absolute pleasure. Um, despite the occasional Wi-Fi hiccup, I think it's um, it's gone. In, you know, I've been I'm incredibly happy with it. Thank you so much for being our first guest um, and answering my suite of sometimes bizarre questions. It was a real joy on my part. Right. Well, it was been a, a, a real pleasure talking to you. Your, your questions were excellent. I Thank have you. no idea how long you're going to have to spend editing all this, but, but I, uh, I thank you again for that opportunity to uh, you know to talk about these wonderful issues. And hopefully, we'll do it again. Excellent. Thank you, Carl.